Good morning and welcome to the January 28th, 2020 meeting of the Paulding County Board of Education. We're so glad you could uh, take some time and join us this morning. We're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. And uh, at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Opie from the Oasis Family Life Church to the podium. And uh, she will perform our invocation. And then once she's done, Board Member John Dean will lead us in our pledge. If everyone would, please stand. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Father, as these men and women gather around to serve the families in this community by inspiring, by encouraging and engaging the children that are dear to your heart. Father, we pray that you would give them wisdom, the supernatural wisdom that supersedes human understanding to care for what is important to you. Father, we need you. We pray for unity. We pray for understanding. We pray for guidance. We pray that your kingdom come and your will be done in the community and Paulding County. God, we thank you for these men and these women. God, we pray for their families. We pray for our, those that are near and dear to their hearts. We thank you for the opportunity to serve your people. And we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> All right, and the first item is to adopt the agenda for today. Do I hear a motion? So moved. So moved by Ms. Lyons. Second by Mr. Dean. Any discussion? All in favor, please show by raising your hand. Motion passes unanimously. And now we need to approve the minutes from January 14th. Do I hear a motion? So moved. So moved by Ms. Lyons. Second by Mr. Dean. Any discussion? All in favor, please show by raising your hand. Motion passes unanimously. At this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Otot for the superintendent report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start this morning by sharing some of the good things that are going on in our district. I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Reverend Johnny McBurrows for his invitation to the fifth annual Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church Martin Luther King commemorative service that was held on January 20th. And I would say this was truly a community event. It was great to see everyone out there and it was just really a privilege to be able to share a few thoughts on that special day. Also, I want to brag a little bit about our uh, district's social emotional learning teacher on assignment, Brandon Quinn. He actually shared at the last Paulding Family Connections meeting about social emotional learning. I think did a great job and it really focused on meeting, um, how we're meeting our students' needs uh, uh, in the area of social emotional learning. Also last week, our Paulding District PTA hosted its January meeting. And of course, the vision of PTA and national PTA is every child, one voice. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of our PTA units, all of our PTA members um, throughout this county, because their support at our elementary, middle and high schools is just phenomenal. I also want to thank Dallas PTA for hosting the event. Some great news. This last Friday, January 24th, the district had 24 students from six schools presenting projects at the Northwest Georgia Technology Competition at Georgia Highlands College in Rome. And I'm excited to report that we had three students who uh, placed first in that competition in animation, Olivia Steger from Shelton Elementary, digital game design, Andrew Sorrells from Ragsdale Elementary, and multimedia applications, that would be Lexi Angestat and Kate Catherine Summers, both from Abney Elementary. Congratulations to those students. Congratulations to those students and all who represented our district at that technology fair. This last Saturday, we had 126 students from 14 schools participating in the Helen Ruffin Reading Bowl. Also like to thank South Paulding for hosting that event. And our winners this year, we have our two-time champions at the elementary level, New Georgia Elementary, at the middle school level, Austin Middle, and at East uh, High School is East Paulding. And for those who are not familiar with the Helen Ruffin Reading Bowl, that's basically a competition where students all read a same, a same text, and then they're actually having quiz questions specifically about the text and their level of comprehension. And also lastly, in the good news, I'd like to thank Ernst Young. Uh, they're offering a program to seventh and eighth grade girls, and this program is being offered currently 
at Scoggins, Dobbins, McClure, and Rich Middle Schools. And it's basically targeting girls and providing them information about not only STEM careers, but also STEM exploration activities. And it's an app-based program and just really excited to see that program continue to grow. I was able to go to Dobbins um, for the rollout of that. I'd like to thank Julie for coming out that day as well. Um, I really thought it was great for Julie to be there seeing that she is in the stemmiest career we probably have right here in computer technology, but it's just a great event. In terms of district news, uh, the FY22 budget survey is available to our community. Um, this is a vehicle for students and parents and staff to provide feedback as we develop that FY22 budget. And in my superintendent's report, I provided the link. If people uh, have not visited our website, uh, it is available uh, for you to provide that feedback. Steve's actually gonna give an update on that in his uh, primer report. Also, we'll be releasing the 2021-22 school year, 2022-23 calendar survey this week. Um, the message is gonna be sent home to all families and the survey will also be available on our district website. Again, students, parents, staff, and community, please provide your feedback. And of course, we'll bring that back to our board um, in terms of uh, recommendation for those two calendar years. House Bill 251 school choice application uh, will open on January 31st and close on February 14th. And we have sent the traditional letter we send home every year in regards to House Bill 251, but also there's a great deal of information available on our website and I've included that link here. Also very exciting, applications for the first class of Hiram Academy of Computer Science will be available on February 3rd. This is a program of choice and will have a focus of course on computer science. The staff at Hiram High School hosted an informational meeting last week. Talk with Ms. Cooksey, they had over 45 families present at that presentation. And if you are a parent of a rising ninth grade student interested in the academy, you can visit the Hiram High School website for additional information. And of course, we'll be sending a blast email out to all of our community about that as well. I'd also like to take a minute to spotlight our assistant principals for their hard work in supporting our schools and also wanting the board to know that we really want to invest in them and provide them professional development to support their growth. And our APs meet four times a year. And basically we bring them together to discuss issues that will help develop them as future leaders in the districts. And we also have done something new this year where we offer them a lunch and learn where we bring them in between those two sessions. Um, and we generally cover, uh, this last was human resources, but cover topics of interest to them. But again, appreciate our assistant principals for all they do. Just a couple of events here on uh, January, Friday, January 31st is Friday at 7 p.m. The middle and high school Paulding County Honor Course will be performing. That's where all of our middles and high schools um, will join together. That's in Paulding County High School Auditorium. Our third annual Special Olympics Polar Plunge is Saturday, February 8th at Roundtree Recreation. I've included a link again to that event. And again, this all sponsors the Paulding County Special Olympics. And of course, our next board meeting will be Friday, um, or I'm sorry, Tuesday, February 11th uh, here at the Board of Education Office. And of course, we have a new starting time, which is 6.30 for our evening meetings. Um, as I close, I'd like to bring a little bit of attention to our agenda. You'll notice, or you know, this is our first work session format today. This is the first time we're kind of plowing ahead with a new format to our meetings. Just wanted to take a second to give you an overview of the agenda. The agenda items are actually placed by our area that they, they influence our strategic plan. This morning, and that would be organizational excellence, student success for all, communication and engagement, and cultivating and retaining high quality professionals. Um, there are five items under uh, agenda item six, organizational excellence, that'll be for consideration to be added to our next meeting agenda. And again, those are items C, D, E, F, and G. And as we review those, um, ultimately we'll determine um, if they will be added to that agenda and whether they be added to the consent or an action agenda, which would allow additional discussion. Um, we have four presentations today, including our custodial update, our monthly financial report, as well as a review of our primer as we do every time. Uh, this year's begin budget season is also STEM and HR. Um, the last thing I'd like to draw your attention to on our agenda is um, action uh, item 14, action. Um, at all of our meetings, um, unless uh, something should change, we would still have approval of personnel as an action agenda item and also C, which is our field trip report. And I wanted to let the board know why that was included there. 
we have a number of field trip requests and we want to make sure that we're responsive and timely and getting those back to our schools so they can do their planning and uh, I want to thank everybody for giving me a couple minutes there to run over that <coughs> and mr. chairman if you're ready we'll start our um, uh, agenda under organizational excellence with a custodial update from uh, SMS and I know you guys are here and I'd invite you forward if you could please come to our podium and introduce yourselves to the board and uh, again take a couple minutes to talk about where we are I would like you to know that we meet regularly uh, with representatives most frequently Don and I know that our Don Brelove meets with them on a weekly basis to discuss uh, items of interest and challenges and opportunities uh, but did want them to come forward and just kind of share where we are with the program and where we're moving. So Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Otak. Thank you, board. Uh, it's great to be back in front of you again. Um, we're excited to be here, uh, present to you kind of an update of where we uh, kind of have been, where we are, and where we're going. So that's why we brought our actual operations team with us, because I felt like who better to answer those questions than the boots on the ground that are, that are in the schools every day, meeting with the principals and interacting with the employees. So again, my name is Adam Miles, and I'm going to turn it over to Don Clark, our director of operations, who's going to run through, <clears throat> excuse me, the update. And if there's any questions at the end, we'll be glad to answer any of them. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Otot, ladies and gentlemen of the board, we are thrilled to be back in front of you. Um, Adam and I were here the last time. We had some work to do. Uh, that is expected uh, from, from any startup. And I don't know if I'm supposed to be turning this thing or how, th how this thing works. Is it on? <laughs> you do that. <laughs> She's going to be my big helper. Um, Dr. Otot mentioned excellence. And uh, we should all strive for excellence. We're all educators. Uh, we all have a, a part. Uh, in, in teaching our kids and, and growing a community. And um, does it work? No. no. All right. There we go. Uh, my name is Don Clark. I'm the uh, Senior Regional Director of Operations. Um, I work for Jessica. Jessica is your general manager here. Uh, she is a 2007 graduate of East Paulding High School. Um, uh, Jessica oversees the day to day operations. Uh, here in Paulding County. Uh, her team is uh, Kira uh, Summerhour, uh, who is also a, um, uh, she's local. Um, David Williams, David Williams brings a lot of experience to the table. Uh, and you'll see some pictures of these folks in the next slide. Lori Quinn, who is a 2006 graduate of East Paulding High School, is also part of our management support staff. Uh, we're lucky to have her. And then we have met uh, Mr. Miles already. Um, you can see the team here. Uh, this team works together very well. They all bring something to the table and they feed off of one another. And I think that um, going forward uh, from an aspect of excellence uh, for our kids, uh, th this is what it's going to take. Next slide, please, man. Uh, all of the things you're going to see here, we, we discussed during the first board uh, meeting. Uh, there are check marks next to these now. Uh, meeting with all the district representatives, principals, on board recommendations, uh, Mr. Breedlove, myself, and, and uh, his staff, and, and our SMS staff meet each Wednesday. We discuss these things. Uh, we stay very well organized, thanks to Mr. Breedlove and, and his team, and we appreciate that. Uh, this was a startup. It was a challenging startup. This is a large school district. Uh, some of the things that, um, that took place here were absolutely expected. Uh, we were not perfect. Uh, we strive for excellence every single day. Uh, we missed the mark on some of those things, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we're not here to place blame on, on, on anything. What we are here to do is find a solution and move forward. Job fairs, bringing local jobs to the community, all of that is part of what we do as a partner in education. Um, some of the things that we've done to simplify and make things more productive uh, in, in striving for excellence, new equipment, um, installed chemical mixing stations. People don't have to guess what, they, what they're supposed to do. We've brought in checklist cards, uh, training programs. We have partners uh, in training from Spartan Chemical uh, and, and from, from other uh, vendors out there that, that assist us uh, and, and give us what we need to make sure that our employees and our team members are set up and, and empowered to do their jobs. There we go. Uh, and we are closely following um, the recruiting models uh, and the cleaning models as a hybrid partnership 
uh, from, from Paulding County Schools. We think it's important that we do that uh, one team, one heartbeat. And it, that's, that's been working very well. Recruitment. Recruitment's been one of the challenges. Um, the economy is pretty good these days. Um, our, our challenge is, is not other cleaning companies, it's Dunkin' Donuts, it's Chick-fil-A, or what have you. Um, but I think uh, when we started this company, uh, Southern Management Services was, was started uh, with good ethics and character and integrity and transparency. Um, and so we bring that to our employees and I think uh, we had some challenges in the beginning for sure. Uh, with retention, et cetera, and those things have changed, and we'll show you how we did it. Uh, we've got career fairs. We've partnered with Goodwill. We've partnered with, with uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are bringing jobs from the local community into Paulding County Schools. Um, this is an important page, the recruitment here. We'll see when we talk the first time. Uh, these numbers, we had 151 potential candidates. Uh, we, we talked to each of these folks on the phone, not the same as a face-to-face -face interview. Um, 59 of those folks never showed up for fingerprinting. That's a time waster, it's not efficient. Um, new staff uh, that we hired were 56. We had a 61% attrition rate. Uh, that's, that's unheard of. 22 of those folks resigned and five were terminated for one reason or another. The changes that we made based on conversation that we had with our, with our team, we had 163 new candidates, all of whom were invited to a face-to-face -face interview. 130 of those folks did not show up, but that did not eat into the efficiencies of our human resources team here at Paulding County. I think that was a big complaint with, with the former vendor. Um, we hired 20 of those folks, so we're, we're hiring more quality versus quantity at this point. Uh, we've dropped down to a reasonable 9.5% attrition rate. Um, we've had one person resign. That's it since then. Uh, and, and four, we had to, we had to let go uh, for one reason or another. 51% improvement on our retention rate. And so I think that's, that's something to, to take note of. Um, we're getting the people in the door and they are staying. So, uh, some of the programs that we have, employer referral program. Um, we're offering some financial compensation. You, as a team member, help us recruit. Uh, they, they are good employees. They stick around. They are good stewards of, of, of our clients' money, Baldwin County Schools, and we're gonna reward you. Um, we got yard signs made, as you can see to the right here. We're gonna have those up uh, throughout the school systems as, as our principals allow us to do so, uh, just to let people know that we are continuously hiring and we're looking for excellent candidates um, people that smile and, and, and want to help uh, in education, want to become partners in education for Paulding County Schools. Uh, and, and that's going to be a great program for us too going forward. Our training programs, uh, we had a, had a training program and <laughs> Ms. Jessica led that. Uh, I got a lot of phone calls that day. I got a lot of text messages on how really um, superb it was. Uh, we offered up some, some nice programs, some incentive programs uh, to help these folks out, whatever they need. We do care about our employees. Uh, when their birthdays come around, if somebody gets sick, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, the training discussed everything from human resources to equipment use to chemical use to um, anything you could imagine in the service industry that, that you would need to uh, your employees to know and it went very very well picture on the right that's that's Kira doing some training with an employee on fogging uh, we want to get ahead of any any of these little nasties that, that come about during the winter time um, in terms of uh, cleanliness and sanitation to make sure that our students are in fact coming to school and they're not at home sick we want to get those grades up I think that'll do it that'll help at least um, customer feedback and challenges listen we weren't perfect uh, we, we, we certainly had some challenges during that startup, as, as expected. Uh, some of our grades from, from some of the principals could have been better. Um, I think we've, we've addressed that. We've got communication solutions, training solutions in place. Uh, we've got equipment solutions and chemical solutions in place. Uh, and going forward, um, that's, that's going to help us out. So staffing consistency was a challenge. We've addressed that. We've reconstructed our hiring programs we talked about earlier. Um, some of the detail things, mopping floors, vacuuming, uh, and rest, restrooms have, have been a bear, and they, they kind of are anywhere we go, not an excuse. 
we're finding solutions to that. How do we do that? Well, we're in there more often. We're, we're trusting but verifying. We're training our employees uh, on the importance of, of sanitation. We want our parents to be able to walk into these schools and not worry about their children going to a, a, a restroom that is unclean. We don't need that, none of us. <laughs> um, so we are combating uh, that through, through training and verification and inspection cycles that we're doing. Uh, some of the success stories, we've got floaters in here. We, we're following the Paulding County model of having floaters, trainers. Um, uh, nobody gets to go into a school without proper training first. Uh, and, and, and that's been a big help. I think that's cut down on, on our resignations and has increased um, our retention level. So we've modified that and subsequently we have a 51% retention rate improvement over the last time we spoke. Uh, and some nice letters that we get sometimes. This is a poster, Ms. Felicia. Did a good job. <laughs> All right. Transparent reporting. Uh, communication between Paulding County and SMS, it's ongoing. Uh, this is something that we do uh, on a continuous basis and every week we meet, every Wednesday. Uh, staffing reports, we're very transparent with, with all of those. Um, outages, floater movements, any of those things, we're, we're transparent with, with, uh, with the principals. And that's, that's the important part, um, letting those ladies and gentlemen know who is in their school and, and when we have challenges. Uh, and then we have a solution. We work together with, with our, our day team uh, to, to solve those solutions or solve those, those challenges. And that's been working out very, very well. There is no us and them. Um, it's one team, one heartbeat. Employer recognition, we had a team Christmas appreciation luncheon. Uh, you can see our, our management team up there. Um, right here, Mr. Mr. Ricky Dutton. Um, he was one that uh, brought in some folks for us. Uh, they did what they said they were gonna do and subsequently he is being rewarded here financially. Um, and he's got another one coming in February. Uh, and we are we're quite certain that, that uh, that's, that's gonna happen too. Uh, Ms. Jessica threw a luncheon for them, had it catered. Uh, I believe this was at East Paulding. Uh, yes. Yeah, East, East Paulding High School. Um, and, um, and so we just, we do appreciate our folks and we wanna let them know that uh, subsequently, um, I, I think they, they're sticking around longer and that's a good thing for us, for all of us. I'm gonna let Mr. Uh, Miles talk about the scholarship commitment here, if, if I may. Uh, just for a second, and uh, I think that's important to, to the school district. Sure. Thank you again, Don. And um, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence by reading all this to you, but just wanted to kind of go over some of the details of what we had planned on doing. Um, as you may or may not remember, in our last <clears throat> meeting, we spoke on a scholarship, an annual scholarship commitment. Um, and uh, that's just something that we do as your partner for education because we believe in um, higher education. We want to help. We want to help our partners advance those students who want to go and get their um, get their education at the uh, at the higher education level. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to be at the um, April board meeting. We're planning on coming and presenting a uh, a scholarship check for ten thousand um, dollars to the uh, Paulding Education Foundation. Um, we're going to be doing that every year that we're your partner. Um, that's going to be unwavering. So what we had identified was kind of April as that board meeting to come and do that. Um, if that, if that, if that suits you guys. Um, so what, what that is ultimately is a $50,000 commitment over the term of our, of our five year contract that we're going to be committing to uh, students in Paulding County and hope that, uh, they can make best use of it and go on to, to great things. So, um, we're excited to be able to do that. Um, and we appreciate the opportunity. On uh, this next is just kind of the closing remarks. Um, again, um, Paulding has been so supportive and engaging uh, as a partner for education. Uh, obviously, each day brings new opportunities uh, for growth and improvement uh, for us uh, and, and our counterparts. Um, we work collaboratively. We're not perfect, and we're not going to pretend to be perfect. But kind of, I think what our plan is is identifying issues, bringing resolution and implementing improvements so that it doesn't become habitual. And all the while we're having those, those conversations with Mr. Breedlove and his team so that everyone's in the loop, so that you guys are in the loop, so that there's no secrets and, and there's nothing that comes as a blind side to you. Um, again, everyone that we've worked with so far has, has been very supportive and, uh, and we're looking forward to a long and lasting uh, relationship with you guys.
So with that being said, I'm going to open it back up for Q&A, and I will turn it back over to Don and his operations team. Uh, uh, thank you, Adam, Don, Jessica. Uh, did want to say and, and elaborate on a few items. We anticipated there would be bumps in the road through transition. I will tell you from the district's perspective, the biggest difference that we've had with SMS than previous vendors is the higher level of communication and the ease of communication. We know exactly who we're talking to and you see these folks right here. It's the same people. We're not having the transition in upper leadership and the challenges associated with working with a much uh, larger mega corporation. Uh, again, we anticipated transition issues. Our team meets on a weekly basis to identify those issues that we, uh, and I'll be honest with you, we have high expectations and addressing those issues and working towards solutions. But I did want to thank you all for coming in and sharing with us this morning and, and of course, <clears throat> willing to answer any questions. Yeah, we'll do. I'll, I'll have to keep some order here. I'll just start down here with Mr. Chester. <clears throat> we'll just work our way down. If you don't have any questions, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> let everybody go. If you have a follow-up question, I'll, I will go back around and start back with Mr. Chester again. Um, and uh, we can go ahead and do that now. We'll just work our way down to Mr. Dean. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for coming and presenting. Just to be clear, ballpark, how many full-time employees working within the district do you generally have right now? 116. 116. 116 and part-time um we go by fte okay <laughs> so full-time equivalent uh so so two part-timers will be one full-timer uh, and we have 116 ftes that means we probably have 140 humans <laughs> okay that yes, works sir. yes sir um and correct me if i'm wrong and i think our council can speak to this there's no I, do, I don't remember, and you can tell me this is the question, I don't remember if there were any contractual restrictions in the agreement that restricted you from hiring temps, um, anything like that. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. So in terms of staffing, and this, this is where I'm going with this, I'm trying to understand in terms of recruitment mm -hmm. um, what you're looking at in terms of being completely staffed for our district? Um, are you looking at seasonal employees, um, less than full-time, temporary? Um, are, are all those kind of things options for you to make sure that um, you know, you're in 100% compliance with, your, with the contract? Yes, sir. We, we we impose no restrictions, nor are there any restrictions of which I am aware mm -hmm. uh, contractually. Uh, the people that work part-time uh, apply for part-time. Right. Uh, the folks that work full-time apply for full-time. Uh, we are right, we're, we're very close, if not exceeding where we need to be. Okay. Uh, currently with, with, our, with our staffing, uh, that came down to the changes that we made on our interview and, and, and uh, vetting process. So um, our expectation is that we will continue to move forward. Uh, we have a full-time recruiter here. That's, that's all Lori Quinn does. She supports us uh, from a recruiting primarily HR aspect, works very well with the Human Resources Department here at Paulding County Schools. So I don't anticipate uh, those big challenges and certainly not to the level we had in the beginning. Okay. Thank you, sir. And I'd also add, we do have employees that work for the district as well as SMS in a part-time. Yes, sir, that is correct. And I'd like to get some information on that whenever you get an opportunity. Uh, and, and the reason I ask is obviously one of our prior concerns over the years has been staffing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, we want to make sure that, um, you know, we're getting everything we propose out of the contract and and then when it comes to staffing and employment uh, not only within you know our district but within our county you know we're pretty blessed our you know our employment numbers are decent for the economy but you know there's a wealth of our own community that if there's an opportunity to work in any capacity um, with our district and for us to use our community's funds to employ our own community that's that's a high priority for this board so 
we want to make sure that um, every vendor, not just you, but every vendor uh, maximizes the opportunity to employ our people, whether that's full-time, part-time, temp, or whatever, um, whatever process we can, we can get them in. That's, that's one of the highest priority for this board is to make sure that we use our, you know, frankly, our taxpayers' dollars to employ our taxpayers. So. Thanks, Mr. Chester. Our, our, uh, we are on the same page, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, just uh, one thank you guys for coming out. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to care about our district as much as we do. Um, and I mentioned to Mr. Otot, um, you know, a citizenship award of some sort to uh, encourage our students to clean up their act of themselves, to be responsible citizens, and, and maybe somehow we can do an incentive to kind of help you guys out so that you don't have to clean up behind them, but they really learn how to clean up behind themselves. and. And uh, be a, that would be a partnership also, but that's up to Dr. Otot and our staff. But uh, I also wanted to say that you have a great tie on today. Thank you so much. And I appreciate that. we're going to spark that. joy in everything we do. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Long. Thank you. So, um, so I do have a couple questions, and thank you all for coming out today in the presentation. Um, one of the things I did not see in the presentation, um, and I think most people know I'm kind of a black and white guy, so... Um, you know, around efficiencies, around service level agreements, since we are managing taxpayer money. Um, what are we hitting? What are we not hitting? What schools are clean? What schools are not clean? Like, that's the stuff I want to know. Like, I appreciate everything y'all have done. Um, but, you know, and I hear kind of what I hear from parents and teachers and staff members in schools, but do you have data you can show us that kind of backs up what's in the presentation to show us where are those gaps amongst our school buildings and what does that look like so we can see transparently what we need to improve on sure. um, we, throughout the district? I think just because, and, and I'm, I'm going to say, you know, also be mindful that I know this was a significant implementation to your point. I, I agree with that. Um, and you know i think because of your predecessor the bar is extremely high on execution um and we're talking about tens of millions of dollars here so um i have interest in just knowing um you know are we hitting the service level agreements if we're not why are we not hitting them mm -hmm. and what is what can we do as a board to help you know you know our staff our superintendent you all ensure that those things are going on if that's going to be a budget issue this year what does that look like um but i think just because of the significance of this issue that's been going on for a year two years three years four years sure. five years um we need to be hitting every every measure and if you are i think we should tell that story if we're not i think we should t still tell it and figure out okay what do we have to do to kind of get there sure. um so i just want to make that one comment um and then I think, too, um, you know, I think that's the, the data you shared, Mr. Chester, answered my, asked my other question about FTEs and kind of where y'all are at. And um, I know that's, that's a, a significant challenge in terms of recruitment and retention. And it seems like in the short term, y'all have, you know, done the best that you, you can be doing, I think, under the circumstances. So I do want to give you that positive feedback um, because I know that's a significant challenge. Um, but for me, it's, it's all dollars and cents, and um, I want to make sure our schools are clean and our principals are happy um, at the end of the day. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. All right. <clears throat> My only question is, um, during your interview process, do, are they just brought in to just generically interview for a job, or do they already kind of know what school there's a need for? In other words, do you have any issues where you bring somebody in, they live in one part of the county, but your need is in the south part of the county or the east part of the county, and they may not take that job because of driving or so on and so forth. How is that going for y'all? Thank you for that question. Uh, something that we address <clears throat> um, actively. Uh, we are not sending someone that lives in South Paulding up to North Paulding. Uh, the, when the folks come in, they understand, we, we, we ensure that they understand what the job entails. Um, it is a cleaning job, however, uh, we are not sending people from south to north. Uh, everyone that's in our schools, and I, I believe we've got that pretty well cleaned up, uh, it is an ongoing challenge. 
what schools are closest to your house? Well, we have a map. We'll sit there and we'll, we'll work, there, work with them during the interview process. We've got openings here, here, and here, even if we don't have openings. Uh, let's add something to that school. Let's, let's give, it, give it something uh, that, that maybe it doesn't have now, uh, even if it's, if it's an overage, so to speak, in staffing. And then once some things move around, um, what, what we don't want people to do is uh, we don't want them driving too far, burning their gas. That costs them money. Um, they won't stick around very long, et cetera, et cetera. All the things that come along with that. So, yes, sir, we are addressing that, uh, and, and it is successful for us. Mr. Albright. Mr. Albright, make sure your microphone is. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you all for coming out. Thanks, um, I think uh, I think when uh, when you all were here last time, I was pretty clear what my expectation was. Uh, my expectation has not changed. I understand that we have uh, we have uh, come through uh, what I have discussed previously with, with other <coughs> folks. Sort of a a 90 day ramp up period yes, sir. and that uh, that 90 day period has come and gone That's right. and so uh, my expectation for that period of time was that at the end of that 90 days well we've got these problems fixed okay we're talking about cleaning schools mm -hmm. here okay uh, you know we're not talking about you know, complicated mathematics and, you know, scientific research and stuff. We're talking about cleaning schools. So at the end of that 90 days, I expect that everything would have the bumps in the road are smoothed over and everything is operating well. And so uh, <clears throat> it's time to get it, it's time for us to measure a baseline now. OK, and I think the best way to measure that baseline is um, uh, as I understand, there's going to be some surveys and such and everything going out and getting people's opinions and all that sort of thing going out. Well, I could, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think me, and I don't want to put words in other board members' mouths, but um, I, I think we can form our own opinions based on information, okay? Um, while other people's opinions may be helpful, uh, that's not what I'm looking for. I don't, you know, uh, so what I think I would like to see um, is, uh, and you can answer this uh, for me in just a moment, but I think what I'd like to see is the actual requests from school principals, administrators, whoever the local people are, <coughs> that are made to you that says, hey, this wasn't done, we need to fix this. This is a problem, you know. I want to actually. I, I want to. I want to see either those reports or those requests. I, I'm assuming they send them to you electronically, okay? Uh, so those uh, those electronic reports and everything can be compiled and put into a report, uh, broken down high school, middle school, elementary school, uh, and then uh, and then that information can be provided to the board members, and we can begin to form our own opinions. And develop a baseline of you know how things are working okay and then after we have that information if we want to send out these surveys and get people's opinions about stuff well then we can add their opinions to the information but like I said I'd rather form my own opinion uh, before I am you know before reading everybody else's opinions and forming information about data um, because the, the bottom line is and again uh, I, I am sort of a very bottom line sort of person, okay? Is the school clean, okay? And I don't mean to sound jerkish or anything, so y'all forgive me. But frankly, I could care less about what your problems are. Correct. Okay? You got problems hiring people? That's a you problem, not an us problem. That's right. Okay? You got problems retaining people, people not showing up? I'm sorry, we're paying you a buttload of money, and that's a you problem. That's right. Okay? I want the schools cleaned. Our parents want the schools cleaned. Our parents demand that those schools be cleaned, okay, for our students. And so that's what they demand. That's what we demand. Yes, sir. Okay. So, and again, all of this, all of the understanding that all of this is stemming from a history, okay? Sure. 
And so I want you to understand, it's not that I have low expectations for you guys. To the contrary, I have very high expectations. And I have a very high confidence level that SMS is going to do this and do it very well. Okay? Um, and so I think if we can develop that, uh, that baseline, find out exactly where we are right now, okay? Mm -hmm. We've had time. We've had that ramp up time. Fine. It's done. It's over. Where are we now? Okay? So um, I don't know how long that would take to put stuff like that together, put a report like that together. We can identify metrics. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if maybe, you know, maybe, you know, let uh, maybe when we come back again, 1st of February, let us know, you know, if it's going to take another two weeks or another month, whatever, however long it's going to take to put that stuff together, uh, the information. Okay. Mr. Harbour, I can, I can address that quickly. Um, we are putting out report cards. For the opinion, I'm sorry, you're putting out what? R report cards. Report cards. Yeah, customer service. Report cards. Okay. Um, I've been in education for a long time. We, uh, educators, I'm an educator, my wife's an educator. And we understand A through F. We know what an A means, we know what an F means, we know what everything in between means. So we're doing, we're, February 1st, we will put out our report cards based on that metric. Uh, each one of those letter grades has a score so we can put that mathematically. <clears throat> We then take a trend analysis of our inspections that we do daily, and that includes Paulding County and SMS. We're all in the very same system that we promised you during, uh, during our bid process. Uh, how our inspections look versus the opinions of the school administrators. We take those metrics and put them together. If, if, if it's off, then we need to start, we need to take a look at, at kind of how we're grading because our opinions don't mean anything. With those principals, that that's their school. Mm -hmm. It's what they think, and and the feedback they're getting from the parents, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so we want to we want to try to closely match what we think based on to what they think. Um, well, let, those can I, can I, I'm sorry, can I interrupt just one second? Absolutely, okay. yes, sir. Because that's the important that's a that's an extremely important part of what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and here's the issue: you're you're, you're talking. Um, you're talking about your relationship, communication, and getting stuff done with the principals and everything, okay? And you've got a grading system, and you're working on that grading system, and that's all great and fine, okay? Um, but uh, we're not here to grade your grading system, mm -hmm. okay? We're here to we're here to see and to find out what the principals and administrators in our local schools. Are saying to you okay now your grading system may be a plan to fix those problems okay and that's great all right uh, and that needs to be there that's a, that's a good thing that it's there okay what I want to see is what we need to see is so that we can develop a baseline of where we are are the reports that the administrators are giving to you mm -hmm. okay yes. that's what we need that's the information that we need to say okay this is working, this isn't working, okay? Because once we have that information, okay, and you explain and, and, and show us how that relates to your grading system, okay, well, then we can then sit in judgment if necessary, okay, about, okay, your grading system is working or your grading system stinks, right? okay? You know, because, it, you know, it, it's a good thing to have that grading system. I'm sure it, it helps for your internal efficiencies and everything, okay? But those internal, your internal efficiencies uh, may or may not be where the rubber meets the road for us, okay? And so if we have the information from the, you know, whatever, you know, they type up an email, they type up a notice or send it to you, okay, about this is what happened, okay? Um, this was missed. This wasn't done. We need to redo this or whatever, whatever the case was or is, all right? That's the information we need to see, okay? Because those are the things, unless they're anomalies somehow or things that just came up that nobody could have thought of, okay? Uh, those are the kinds of things that should have been worked out, at least in my mind, okay? I don't expect to see things on those reports that are being sent to you guys mm -hmm. that aren't anomalous, all right? I don't want to see things that are common every day, you know. You know those, are, those are the things that should have been taken care of in the ramp up. Okay, those are the things that should have been handled already. The stuff that I want to see is okay. Something fell through the roof and we got to clean it up. That sort of thing. Okay, sure. the you know the anomalies, the rarities, the things that didn't happen. 
Those are the things that we should be working on now, mm -hmm. okay? The day-to-day -day getting it done, you know, doing the job and everything, you should be working on those things right now, at least not in my, in, in my mind. Now, I don't have a whole ton of experience with this, and my assumptions based on all of this may be completely wrong. And I'm willing to accept that and say, okay, you know, there's, a pro there's an additional process that has to happen, okay? But in order to get there, we need to see the information in order to get That's there. Right. Mr. Albright, and, and to, to, to answer that just real quick, uh, that information will be available. The, the grading system that we use only helps, um, helps us help our schools. Mm -hmm. The information that we gather from the principals, that's their, that, that's their view of it. And they're, it's broken down into different areas mm -hmm. uh, that you can take a look at and say, okay, here's where we're at based on what the schools think, not what SMS thinks, mm -hmm. okay? And we want you to have that information. Thank you. That's not a problem. Cool. All right, sir. Um, well, I have a few concerns. I thank y'all for being here. Um, and I know you've only been doing this for like the last three months or so. But the one survey that we have been given, and I would like to start seeing these more like monthly or bi-monthly mm -hmm. and um, not after the staff has been dealing with it for three months. but. Mm -hmm it's consistent. I mean, this isn't most of the schools. It's not a small amount. Um, we have staff that are coming in and working the day. They're coming into the school dirty in the morning, required to take pictures and send to you guys. But they still have to clean because we have kids in these schools. They, they're getting behind on their job for us, making sure these kids have clean schools. There's no reason to come in in the morning and the floors aren't clean or the bathrooms are, are not clean. Um, and they're reporting this and then i mean there's four pages here of schools with issues um now there are some very positive things they say about some of your employees some of the issue is it's not fully staffed i'm not sure how you calculate your ftes i, I would be interested in that um there are some very good staff they say but there's not enough of them at each school in order to do the job so they're starting off at a handicap because you may have two people, but if they're expected to clean 28, 50 classrooms in a certain amount of hours, not to mention six or seven bathrooms, it's impossible. It can't be done. So you're basically setting those people up for failure, which then affects our people the next day. And I know I've noticed quite a few times in the last few months on our personnel list, we've got, we're hiring people to be floaters for us to help our people out during the day. But a lot of the work we're having to do stuff that we're paying for you to do at night. And the whole point is you're in the cleaning business. That's why we're doing this, to take some of this work off our administrators. So when I see our administrators are consistently having to deal with this and not, not getting, there are some communication that they mentioned is positive, but they're not getting the results. Um, it's too, these areas are too large for one person to clean. The equipment's not working. Um, who checks the logs and the notebooks. They believe you've underestimated the size of the buildings. Um, they do not believe that sanitation and cleaning is getting taken place, which requires um, our people try to do it. But we've got kids. I mean, we need the kids at school. If our schools aren't getting clean, our kids are getting sick. Our staff is getting sick. They're not here when, when they could be. Um, there's lack, it says this is the dirtiest our school has ever been. Um, it's rarely vacuumed. These are in multiple schools. Um, also that some have had four, four or five custodians, now they have two. You can't do the job with two people that used to be done with four. Um, there's equipment that's not being used. There's equipment that's broken. And it says, uh, one of them says, SMS uses our old equipment that was left behind and there's brand new wetbacks still in the packing. Somebody needs to be supervising these, the people that you're putting in there. Um, you know, there's people not working. And we've got, I mean, I'm just very disappointed in, in the one, with the one um, survey that we have gotten so far. And I've heard that there's, I know he's asking for a report. If you could explain more about, um, the comp is clean or how that works as far as when they take pictures and send them to you, what's the process after you get those pictures or where do those pictures go? Sure, it's comp clean and it is an inspection device that we use. Um, 
whereby we go around to the to every aspect of the school uh, and that includes the the uh, Paulding County zone managers as well as our managers we take a look at that um, at those areas inspect them on a one to ten scale um, if it's something that is deficient um, that would be somewhere around the, the lower 70 percentile we would uh, then address that with the team offer remedial training if necessary and keeping in mind too uh, Ms. Cobb that the the survey that you have in your hand yeah I get it uh, understood um, that transition period what was very challenging our expectation come February when we put those report cards back out you're not going to see any of these any of these things um, we communicate with our educators our administrators we hear their their challenges and, and we execute on those challenges we are not uh, for a while there and mr. Albright mentioned it our problems should not be your problems uh, we're dealing with that human element um, and and there were some challenges there there's no question about that I think we've got resolution uh, if a school feels like they need more folks we will analyze that how do we slot a school well a lot of it has to do with square footage but that's not the end all what are the activities that take place there how many classrooms are there um, what's our production rate we, we don't want people overdoing it oh they won't come back to work <laughs> so all of those concerns are valid we are addressing those concerns we meet each week um, with with mr. Breedlove and and we've met with with the superintendent and, and others uh, to make sure that we are following the right path and to meet your expectations going forward and to find solutions with any of these challenges as, as they come up so we are addressing those um, and and we let the principal's voice be heard well and as far as retention like I mentioned I, I have heard y'all do you have some really good employees and I hope that they will stay and, and continue to work hard um, are you trying to get any feedback for them as to any issues they may be having I know um, I had I don't know how much time how how were they affected during the holiday breaks are they still allowed to work are they not getting work hours during those time periods where it might affect them to where they have to go get another job or how does how did y'all handle the school breaks that's up to the individual um, <coughs> we had uh, light attrition to say the least I think we had six folks that left us after the both of the breaks combined um, based on that indicator um, I would say that folks are pretty happy up to this point working for SMS we have a, management was a, was, a, was a challenge to begin with and that third manager which we have now he brings a lot of experience to the table very level-headed very kind-hearted gentleman uh, there's been some big changes there Th those schools that you see about that, that have management uh, mentions um, there there it is we had folks that started work for a day started work for three days not your problem all right we don't want to make it that but it happened um, we talked to our folks we go in there and we, we meet with our our team members is there anything we can do for you what do you need and a lot of times what do you want we'll, we'll see if we can help you with that too and so the the solutions are there and we're growing uh, and putting those things in place um, and so it's not going to be a problem to get the reports so we can see what well, the main problems continue to be and what's being done about them you know, once once we put these report cards out um, uh, the, the February report cards we get that data compiled we should have no challenges with, with making sure that you see that and you see what the schools think not what we think okay as well as I, I would like to see how many full-time and how many part-time and how that equates to your FTE sure. um, and then also are all these staff are they background test background checked drug tested they before are, they, are they, come all, in, okay. they are before, they are background checked before background they checks. come in our building yes ma'am okay um let's see and then y'all are how are y'all are providing the supplies as far as the cleaning stations you said yes ma'am okay so there should be no use no no need for them to be using any of our supplies from from our section or into the nutrition because I know nutrition has their separate so they're I've heard concerns about them having to lock theirs up because it was being used by SMS employees so that shouldn't be happening is well, that correct we, we from the beginning there was not supposed to be an us and them we buy supplies they are more than welcome to use that same with our machines same with, with anything else that we purchase uh, and we've we've had no challenges um, there's been some things that we've been asked to purchase because Paulding County was buying something like microfiber 
we did not buy microfiber. Everybody likes microfiber rags. So we're going to buy microfiber. And that way, we're, we're, we're an equal partner. We're not, you know, when, when, when the Paulding County folks grab microfiber, it doesn't matter whose name's on it. We buy it, uh, and they're more than welcome to use that. Okay, and then the uh, last thing is if we could get uh, a report. It mentions that sometimes they haven't seen management in the school. So if there's a report that we could get provided to show that when, when y'all have met with the principals. Sure. Because um, there's some principals at, at, to this point, at the date of this survey, hadn't met with anybody. Um, so I'd like to see that report as to when those meetings happen. Thank you, Ms. Kyle. Thank you again for coming. It uh, takes a lot of nerve to step up here after the survey that we just received. Um, I will say this, I see, uh, I have to agree with Mr. Albright again, this is your problem. We have a contract with you, but I will say I'm seeing the exact same problems that we saw with Airmark. And I've talked to Dr. Otak about this. I think that we as a district have a management problem. Uh, uh, the same problems are people, equipment, and cleanliness. Um, on the survey from the principals who I feel are your end out of users or your customers, if you would, uh, on cleanliness, you got a 67% disapproval rating, and on personnel, you got a 63% disapproval rating. Uh, the highest you got was an 80% 80 appro 80 approval rating. That was six questions, and you averaged 40% disapproval on all of them. Uh, I would have expected that after our three month break in period, if you would, that we would have been a little bit better than that. Um, I would like to see the surveys from the principals who I feel are the end item users and the customers for you uh, continue uh, on a more regular basis, once a month, like Kim said at least. The four pages she was referring to, I'm sure you've read those. Mm -hmm. The best remarks that I saw in there was you're doing better than Airmark which I wouldn't really don't know whether to take that as a compliment or we need to get going. But uh, that's all I have uh, there again. I feel that you have a contract with the district and I look to our district management uh, for leadership on this. And I, I'm, I'm very positive and I understand that you guys are really working with us. And I do appreciate that. That is the other issue that I think that I've heard from principals uh, and from the district <laughs> excuse me, district management, that you are working well with us a lot better. So thank you for that. Thanks, and I was going to share a couple summary comments <clears throat> here, and, and we made this very clear to our partners that we have high expectations mm -hmm. for our buildings. I, I do want to remind board members, and this is not excuse making, this survey reflected the transition period. Mm -hmm. We're moving forward from that with high expectations of what is going to happen in the future. And the other thing, and, and we'll be glad to work with you on FTE reports, but one of the things I want to re remind everybody is that we did not place caps on the number of employees. The expectation is the building's clean. Um, so FTEs aside, expectation is no matter how many people are there, right. we've had this conversation. That's right. That's right. Um, and I would like to wrap up my comments with saying, uh, like you and everyone else, you know there are seven people up here, eight including myself, that high expectations, but I know you have high expectations as well for the quality of service you provide our kids. That's right. And uh, that has always been embedded in our discussions. And the one other thing I'd like to say that uh, we see as a difference is um, working with the same people on a continual basis, not seeing that change of who we're dealing with at the corporate level or anything else is one of the things that I think will help us continue the positive communication and moving forward. Um, and, and towards the data, we will work with you on compiling the data necessary. Um, I do feel like I need to though share with the board that understand every principal has very different expectations of what they expect in their building. You have some with expectations <laughs> that are very high and others that are not, just like people's homes. You go in different people's homes. Our expectations, our classrooms, our bathrooms, and our buildings are clean. That's right. um, we're working with our principals uh, to ensure that happens and, and this partnership will continue with the idea that we're gonna make sure that our kids have the product they need to learn. And, and that's our commitment to our board and our citizens. Thank you, Dr. Can I ask one question? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, this is 
really directed for the staff. Um, and I have a follow-up as well whenever we get to it. Um, are, are we enforcing the service level agreements? Yes, we are. Contract? Okay, I just want to make sure that's <coughs> yes. said for the record. All right, thank you. Mr. Chester. Are we going around again or just? Uh, we can. Go ahead. You can start. Okay. A um, couple of things, and this is not specific. Well, it is specific to, um, to this topic. I just want to remind our, my colleagues that when we agreed to this format, we talked about being um, proficient and efficient and being prepared for these meetings. Um, not that everyone doesn't have valid questions and that they're not all entitled to their time. However, you know, we have to be mindful of what we agreed to and what our norms and protocols are. Um, we're here to do the people's business, but if we spend an inordinate amount of time on each one of these subjects, we will have to order lunch when we have these meetings because they will continue, they will go a long time. So um, I think it's better to be said at this first meeting of the year than to have this conversation this summer. But we talked about it, we talked about it amongst ourselves and you know, it just needs to be said out loud. Um, we agreed to A, be prepared, to be concise, email any questions that you may have that you can think of beforehand ahead of time. Um, and I want to be clear, that's not to restrict anybody's time or that their questions are invalid or not appropriate. It's just that we agreed amongst ourselves to do it a certain way. And if we get away from that, these meetings will get longer and longer, which I don't have a problem with, but you know, I think it's up to us to keep to what we agreed to as colleagues. Um, so having said that, you know, I'd, I'd also just, you know, point out that you know, the chair could, or we could ourselves restrict the times for questions to five minutes each or three questions. And I don't think that's something we want to do. I think this particular subject, there's a world of information out there. We've been doing this for seven years, six years, a long time. So again, it's not that anybody's questions are invalid and I'm not you know, pointing directly to any one of my colleagues. I'm one of the seven members, but I just want to say we as colleagues agreed to do this a certain way. We agreed to put it in writing and we agreed how generally these morning meetings will go. If we stray away from that, then you know, anything else we agree to really won't be worth a damn. Now, having said that, for this particular subject, we've been doing this for years and years, and I would point out to my colleagues and to the chair, um, it is well within our policy and rules for the chair to appoint a committee from the board to follow along more closely with this particular contract. I don't think we've ever had a contract like this before in the district, at least not in the last 10, 15 years. Um, we do this a little differently than we've done it before. And if it's that many detailed questions, which I don't have an issue with, I would recommend that that's something we look at so that if a or several members of the board have more specific detailed questions, they can meet, they can talk to the superintendent, they can have a conference call every week if they like or once a month. But, and um, we should be cognizant of that. That's all. Um. <clears throat> Speaking on that, I, I do not mind everybody when we have a presentation from one of our contracts or vendor, I do not mind at all everyone getting an opportunity to ask a question. Um, we're not going to email you as a board. We're going to go through Dr. Otot. So those emails that we have in our protocols are about our internal operations, which we send Dr. Otot an email. We ask him. When y'all come in from the outside, you guys aren't necessarily as accessible. I'm not going to email you guys. That wouldn't be right of me to do that. I would email Dr. Otot, find out a response and then I would present it to you guys in a meeting when y'all are here. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Chester, I do agree with you. There are some subjects and topics that we need to limit our questions to, limit to an email, but, but if y'all are coming in once a quarter or once every three or four months, um, 
twice a year, whatever it may be, once a year, I do not mind everybody going and answering or asking you a question. So um, I do agree, though, if it is a repetitive question, if Mr. Chester asks something and then Mr. Dean at the end is asking the same question, I will gavel you and say we've already discussed this because I do not want to use this as let me just repeat and say that what I want to say so people can hear me say the same thing that Mr. Anavatardi said or Mr. Chester or Mr. Fuller said, whatever. Um, but with this one, though, Mr. Chester, I do not have an issue with uh, going around the horn, um, but I do, I do get what you're saying. Um, as far as a committee goes, um, I am reluctant to appoint a committee because at this point, if I were to ask for volunteers to oversee a committee, I wonder who would raise their hand and put the extra time in for that. Um, I do expect uh, our superintendent, Dr. Otot, to keep us informed. And if there is something that needs to be uh, addressed, I, I'm a firm believer that he'll get back to us in a timely manner with that. So um, we can look at committees. If you guys and ladies would like to, um, to volunteer to do that, I'll be glad to speak to you off the record and we'll bring it up in the next meeting. And I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, but just keep in mind, if there is a committee, it is subject to um, open meetings, uh, minutes. Uh, you will have to be here. It will take extra time out of your day and out of your schedules to be here. So if that is something that any of you would like to do, please get with me and I will appoint, uh, I will appoint two or three of you to do it. I do not have a problem with that, Ms. Cobb. Yeah, thank you, um, <clears throat> Chairman Fuller. Um, I hope none of the questions I asked were unnecessary. I don't feel they were repetitive. I wasn't um, speaking to you, Ms. Cobb. I, I, I want to make clear. I'm well, not. I think I spoke longer than anybody else other than your rebuttal to tell us why we need to be concise. You have a right to. You're, you're, you're an equal member of this board. You can okay. ask as many questions as long as you like, and I wasn't speaking directly to you. Well, hey, let's go ahead and wrap this up. As far as the custodial part of it, you can go ahead and finish. And then, but any procedural stuff, we'll put that on the, on the agenda and talk about that separately so we don't take up their time well, talking about our stuff. Go ahead. You can finish. I'll, I'll apologize to anybody if I spoke too long or asked too many questions. This, these agendas, this PowerPoint, we got Thursday or Friday afternoon. Therefore, I received questions Monday about this, which, you know, I stay up till midnight working on this step too. I can't get them all there. But like Mr. Fuller said, these are questions for you that were brought up after the presentation today. So there's some questions that cannot be asked ahead of time. And I do contact, I do contact Dr. Otot for clarification about some of the issues we've had during this transitional period, and I will continue to do so. But if some things are not asked of you till Monday, when the public has had a chance to review some of this stuff, Unfortunately, it's a Tuesday morning and the questions are coming up now. So um, that's why I had so many questions. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Thank and you. Thank and you. Uh, thank we can move into the uh, well, We appreciate report. your time. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, Mr. Barnett, if you want to come forward, you'll provide us our monthly financial report. And as I referenced, this is the beginning of our budget cycle. Uh, so Mr. Barnett puts a budget primer together every year. This is really for our community and our board to see the processes and the rationale behind our budget. So Mr. Barnett, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. So we are going to touch on two fiscal years uh, this morning. First, we are going to talk about FY20 um, just briefly. And uh, we have produced our monthly update. There are hard copies here. It's posted to the website. Uh, as well and so and we'll just step through it real quickly uh, on the screen there so we are looking at FY20 we're looking at year to date through November at that point 41.7 percent of the budget year uh, had elapsed our unassigned fund balance could support two and a half months of budgeted expenditures and that's compared to 2.3 the prior year uh, and if you would zoom in for me there Michelle we'll take a look at the uh, percentage variance uh, of revenue against budget uh, that was 6.7 percent in november if you look at uh, fy19 which is the table you see there that uh, percentage was 6.3 percent and then the average in the chart is six point uh, excuse me is 6.3 also that's the three-year average so again we're trending right where we would expect to be and hit with, uh, with our historical uh, measures for revenue uh, then looking at expenditures exact same chart Again, we look at this every month, we are sitting at 0.4% variance to budget in November. FY19 was a negative 1%. Again, that's the table, and the three-year average was 0%, and that's the chart. So again, we are right where we would expect to be uh, this time of year. Uh, next month, we'll present the board a more detailed quarterly report, but we wanted to provide this kind of brief update on FY20 uh, this morning. So. With that, unless there's questions about 20, we'll transition to FY21 uh, and hit the, uh, the next 
uh, budget year. And so as Dr. Otot mentioned, every year we produce this primer. Good question. Yeah, just one question about yeah. your slide. Which is, you may already get to answer this in this. I apologize if I'm asking ahead of, ahead of turn. Yeah. This, the first document you produced, does that reflect any trends that would be related to declining revenue from the state that we would impact or touch or not or not really not not really because qbs yeah Go set ahead. the formula right. set yes so make sure correct thank you there is something i'm going to mention in just a minute though along those lines so sorry it's a I good asked. lead in no that's great <laughs> Uh, so the primer really is just a, a resource document, so we're not going to go through the whole thing. It's also been a living document over the last few weeks. Uh, ongoing updates as information comes in, we've updated this. I think this is like version five of this document. Um, and we, again, we won't go through it all. The last couple of sections deal with sort of the policy, the board's policy and the structure of the budget. Uh, and then uh, the last section just talks about process, uh, how the, the, the method that we use for budgeting. Uh, so we won't really go into those, really just wanted to highlight a few of those factors that you see up there. Because again, we're just kind of framing, um, it's sort of in a macro level, what the budget landscape looks like for FY21. And so this is designed to sort of be a resource document you can go back to. Obviously, if you ever have any questions about any section of this, we'd love to talk to you about it. So uh, again, I'm going to click through if this thing will work for me. I hope it does. Let's see. Uh-oh, we might be out of luck. Michelle, you may have to... Click through it for me. Let me try one more thing here. Yeah, go ahead and go to the next slide there. So uh, briefly, I just want to show the updated um, uh, uh, presentation schedule. Um, of course, this has been updated since the board approved their meeting dates at the last uh, board meeting. The only date I would really just draw your attention to, and it hasn't really changed, is that June 16th date. Again, if there are hearings required uh, as part of the FY21 budget, <laughs> Um, that is a called meeting day. It's just like FY20. We'd have a hearing in the morning, hearing in the afternoon. Just wanted to make the board aware of that date, June 16th, which can obviously change between now and then. But everything else is going to follow the same pattern as FY20. Uh, we're going to attempt to, to have, if again, if there are hearings required, we're going to attempt to have those earlier, like we did in FY20, in case um, uh, to get ahead of sort of the, the, uh, uh, the deadline for appealing of, of value of a property. We like that. I think the board was supportive of that. But you really can't make that call for sure until around mid-May. If we're confident in the digest numbers we have, we'll roll forward. If not, we may go back to the, the original schedule that we've, we've used in the past. But uh, we feel pretty confident we'll be able to follow the same pattern as, uh, as a prior year. So these next few slides, if you would, Michelle, just kind of click through. I'm going to show you uh, just on each slide, I'm going to mention maybe one thing and really just slow down on a couple of slides. We've updated this. Of course, when you look at those factors, uh, that affect the budget. There are local economic factors, demographic factors. Uh, I think everyone in the room is pretty aware of some of those. We have updated these numbers. So again, limited commercial industrial tax base. We know that uh, about, uh, about our story here in Paulding. I would highlight under the digest column there all the way at the bottom uh, with the updated digest numbers from the counties around the state, we're now, when we compare ourselves, um, that, that delta between the average and Paulding is getting larger. 18% of our digest is non-residential. And if you can look up to the column just to the right a little bit, you can see, or excuse me, to the same columns, we'll just look up, you'll kind of see the percentages for the rest of our comparable districts and then all 35 uh, of our large districts there. And you'll see they're still at around 40%. So wanted to highlight that. The millage rate section in the middle has also been updated with the latest information. You can kind of see that, you know, again, we're lower than the average. So we don't try to make up that gap, you know, on the backs of the residential uh, property owners. So if you would, Michelle, and have to happen to our residential, it'd have to go up about $180 million in value. And that has to do with the number of students, kids in our homes and so forth. So that's only a 7% increase. The real story is the non-residential. Again, that 26% there is supposed to represent a, a missing piece of the pie. That 26% is $2 billion. That's what it would take to really, in essence, balance our digest out to look more like, um, again, the average digest. So I just wanted to highlight that slide. Uh, That's yep. Pressure, <laughs> That's right. That's what I told our leadership Paulding folks. No pressure. Uh, but if you would, yeah, it's just $2 billion. It's nothing. Uh, Great Recession, the lingering effect of that is still uh, with us. And this slide is just showing you uh, really comparing uh, the most current digest against sort of our high water mark, which was back in 2008, the tax year 2008. Uh, and you can see we've kind of gotten back to where we were, but on an inflation basis, uh, we're still lagging behind by about 18%. Uh, 
Uh, next slide here is, is just the top tens we produce. Um, won't really spend any time here. I will mention that Learning Bridge has been unseated in its position by McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. So our ASP program has moved down the list a little bit. Uh, again, large number of school-aged children in our homes, that trend you know, still there. Uh, the persons per household you see there toward the bottom is about nine point we, Paulding are about 9% higher than the state of Georgia uh, on average. So that story continues. Um, and with that, we, we go into the uh, enrollment factors that influence the budget. Um, enrollment growth at this point, again, very preliminary. We still have school choice, a lot of things that are gonna happen between now and when we settle on the final numbers, but we're preliminar preliminarily <laughs> predicting about 2% growth, uh, which is sort of in line with the prior year. In fact, the next slide shows, if you look at the top right, there's our growth for 19 and 20, 1.7%, and we're at about 2.2% right now. That's probably a little high. It's probably gonna be somewhere between those two numbers, 1.7 and 2.2. And the next slide is just some common metrics that we use um, in, in regard to, to projections. So I just, we wanted to include those. One of the, probably the most interesting is the birth rate versus enrollment five years later. And that gap continues to grow. That's a huge indicator of growth. Next slide is, uh, is our building permits, another leading indicator. And you know, I think the consensus uh, of the staff and, and, and everyone we talked with is that dip you see there is not permanent. <laughs> I think you can ride around the county and see that's not permanent, but there has been a little bit of a drop with building permits. The next slide I really wanted to, to mention uh, a little more information. We have shown this slide before, but I've updated it with the most current numbers available, which really were just a few weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago. <coughs> and it's, it's just again highlighting what we've, we've talked about is our enrollment in ESEP, uh, Exceptional Students Educational Programs has grown dramatically. In fact, the chart you see there is about a six-year period, and the growth for that six-year period for ESEP students at Pauling County is about 40%. So if you compare that uh, to statewide ESEP growth, which is about, is, is about 19%. So basically, we we're growing in that period about over twice as fast as the, uh, as the statewide average. So that's, that's interesting. Um, the other thing uh, is concerning, I guess, is that if you look at overall enrollment growth for that same period, enrollment growth was about 7% for that period you're looking at there in that, in that chart. Uh, again, ESEP was 40%. So over five times the growth in ESEP when you compare that against just the overall enrollment growth. So, and you can see that visually in the chart there. So it's something we, we monitor, we trend, we try to understand. And financially, we care about it, again, because if you consider all the sources to support ESEP, local, state, federal, it comes at a cost of about 23% higher than your baseline you know, cost for a, for a student. All right, so moving on to funding factors. Um, uh, this uh, chart here should be familiar to you. It's still saying that we're almost two-thirds percent of our, uh, two-thirds of our, of our revenue comes from state sources. So again, we continue to be very dependent on state sources. Uh, in particular, obviously, we're, we're interested in the budget conversations that are going on uh, right now. And so I wanted to put in a couple of slides. The state um, fiscal economist spoke last week to the General Assembly. I actually have a copy of that PowerPoint if, if anyone on the board is interested in seeing that. I put a couple of slides from his presentation in here. And it's just highlighting, um, as what Mr. Anavitardi was just saying, uh, you know, is highlighting why the budget is seen, the state budget is seen as being tight for FY21, and it has a lot to do with that revenue growth, which he alluded to. Um, and so they've got some bullet points there that from The Economist. This, the slide to the bottom right is the exact same uh, graph there. It's just a little bit bigger, so I wanted you to be able to see it. And, I, and another reason why we care about that is what that's showing is net sales tax by month. And you can see The Economist uh, sort of uh, looking at kind of a, a trend uh, where it's, it's starting to slow the growth. I will tell you, SPLOS is where we care about this. We care about it in a lot of ways, but we care about it in SPLOS because our SPLOS collections typically mirror uh, sales tax collections. I will tell you, we've not seen that yet. And next month when we talk about, um, we have the quarterly report, we'll show you the update on SPLOS 5. And, and fortunately, we have not seen that, that yet. And so that flat line you see there, that's the summer of 18. So they've been sort of trending, uh, you know, sort of a downward turn since then. Again, we, our experience has not been that here in Paulding, uh, thank goodness. Top right is just a little information on the state budget as far as um, uh, income tax, the state income tax, and, and they'll have to make a decision uh, if they want to drop that again. But really, the highlights are there on the, at the bottom left. It's just, it just talks about how much more, uh, how, what the increase is in the state budget to support enrollment growth across the state, uh, $32 million 
uh, increase in equalization. We care about that. We want them fully supporting equalization grant. And it, it appears they, their anticipation or expectation is that they're going to do that. $362 million is in the budget, the state, the, the, the governor's budget for salary increase. I know we've all heard about that. That's the $2,000 um, additional. There's a lot still to be learned about how that's going to play out. What it's going to look like is going to be similar to last year. Um, and so what all uh, employee categories it, it impacts at this point, we're looking at certified, but there's also language in the budget related to transportation. And so this is where this is why it does get complicated. So uh, there's language in the budget. In fact, if you're interested, I have a copy of the budget with me. I can show you. But it speaks about a 5% increase in transportation. Or what it's really saying is that is the supplement that the state provides for transportation, a 5% increase. State only is, and, and I know most of you know this, the state only um, supports about 10% of our transportation budget. So it's really only on the supplement. So, I mean, that's good. We'll take, you know, whatever support we can get. But 5% on that supplement for us is about $50,000. To mirror that percentage raise across the board, you know, as far as for transportation, it'd be about a half million dollars. So it's just one of those things we have to worry about, kind of what's, what's a local impact um, to the state budget. And so that's just an example of that. Good news is there uh, looks like they're going to fully fund the bonds, uh, COPS program, bonds for buses which is a great thing. Other things we're monitoring right now, dual enrollment, the changes associated with dual enrollment, how that'll impact us. Title ad valorem is just something that gets touched every year. I thought this might be a year where things sort of normalize, no such luck. I think they're probably gonna look at the formula again, which again could influence our revenue. And then any kind of grant changes that, are, uh, that, that occur as, a relation, as, as related to, uh, to the budget. Uh, the next slide is just the benchmarks that we talk about every year, our rankings against the 35 large school districts in Georgia and the, uh, and the all 180 school districts, 180 is on the left, the 35 is on the right. And uh, again, it's just a, a document you can refer back to. I will tell you that when it comes to local revenue, we improved. We went from 128 uh, to 121 out of 180 when we're still the 13th largest district. So it's improvement, we'll take it, but we got a long way to go, obviously. And again, we know why, because we just talked about uh, the digest. By the time you factor in all sources of revenue, we've moved up uh, from 154 to 150. So now we're 150 out of 180, again, 12th largest. Uh, I provide this slide every year. It's in, again, just highlighting that high water mark I mentioned earlier um, was back FY09, tax year 2000. I mentioned it earlier. That's when we saw our greatest, uh, uh, I guess, our highest revenue per pupil against the state and against our comparables. In fact, you can see we're $72 off uh, in FY9 from our comparable districts. We were sort of catching up. Today, if you fast forward over to, to the right there, FY19, in the most current data, we're $486 lower than our comparable. So we, we still got, we went, the gap increased and we're still working our way back. And we're still about $1,500 lower than the average across the state. Looking at the historical uh, equalization grant numbers there, I do have good news. I think that, uh, that the likelihood that we'll see a reduction in, in equalization is declining. And that has to do with information, you know, preliminary information we've received from the state as to what other counties are experiencing. So long story is uh, short is that our net digest, our weighted net digest um, compared to the state is sort of, looks like it may be stabilized. In that case, that means there's no, there's no impact on, on, uh, on equalization. So over the pascalization. So looking at operating factors, uh, again, just put the benchmarks in here. This is the targets for, for FY21. It's, it's reality for, for FY20. It's our budget. It also shows you some historical FY19 and so forth. But that, these are sort of our targets that we look at when we, we try to, uh, to construct the budget. And then I just want to put some bullets here that, uh, that reflect sort of the major assumptions, observations, um, challenges that we're looking at uh, for the budget. On the revenue side, local fair share, the decrease in QBE uh, is going to increase. I know that's, that's complicated. What that means is our revenue is going down. And that's just a result of our digest improving. So, the, um, so Q, QBE is written in such a way that as your digest improves, the local fair share component grows and that's a reduction against QBE. So uh, we know that's gonna happen and that's gonna be significant. That's gonna be at least $2 million, a reduction in our revenue. Of course, the change in state teacher scales and those other changes, again, it's a big unknown right now. And so whatever we do, we're concerned about uh, sustainability uh, is a big concern. So we'll obviously be communicating with the board as we learn more about how that's gonna play out. 
Um, but I will tell you, if, if we follow the trend of last year, the state, uh, because of the way payroll is structured and, and, our, and our, um, um, the way the funding is structured, and you might remember this from, from FY20, we're looking at about a $2 million deficit if we were to basically try to mimic across the district the same type raise as what's right now in the budget because the state does not fund us 100% of that, and so there's a local impact, and that's about a $2 million uh, deficit that we'd be looking at. So that's the sustainability part. I mean, we want to make sure you know, we, we can support that for years to come. So we're, that is the biggest, obviously, topic for FI21. Uh, uh, TRS, the employer contribution, I'll mention more in a minute, but it's decreasing to 19.06, uh, uh, and that's, that is a good thing. Um, again, minimal change in equalization. I talked about that. No change in state health premiums for the employer, um, which again is a good thing. Uh, we are anticipating a reduction in, in growth of the digest. Last year, you might remember, the digest grew 8.7%. I think uh, for FY21, uh, which would be tax year 20, you're looking at more maybe of 6 to 7%, which I'll tell you is about a $2 million decline. Again, we're talking about growth. Um, so it's still growing the digest, but that growth is slowing, and that's going to have an impact on our revenue. Title Abbott Lorem tax I mentioned earlier. We'll see how that what comes out of uh, out of the Gold Dome related to that. On the expenditure side, uh, enrollment growth again we're thinking will be right around two percent when the dust settles. Again, ESEP we've talked about to maintain our ratios, our current class ratios, our services that we're providing. We're looking at about a seven point eight million dollar increase to the budget. And all that is are the three things that we've talked about before. That's supporting enrollment growth. It's maintaining the same uh, formula, same ratios. It's just supporting enrollment growth, ESEP growth, and then the step increase for our teachers. That's all that number contains. So there's no, uh, so anyway, that's, that's almost $8 million that we're gonna have to fund. Uh, the TRS again, I'll just mention because it is a net positive to us. Our revenue is going down because the state uh, supports us with TRS but we pay more and so the decline will actually have a positive in, in, uh, influence on the budget i don't know how material will be net but um, probably looking at about a half million dollars again no change in premiums and again we're trying to maintain that 87 13 uh, split but we're also trying to ma maintain the slide before uh, to keep the money focused on instruction next slide is just a result of the board's meeting back uh, with us in october it's the priorities that we talked about in this room and, and so they're just reflected there and just like in prior years, we're going to start to populate the strategies or the initiatives side on the right there as we go through the budget process. And just coming back to our, again, to our approval timeline, next meeting, uh, next presentation, we'll be talking about allotments. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big day where we'll wind up spending about 80% of the budget, maybe 80 to 90% of the budget, because uh, uh, so much of that is, of our budget is people. And we're going to talk about uh, allotments. Um, and so, yeah, so that uh, is really all I had for this morning. There's more, but again, we're always here for questions, and this is really just meant to be more of a resource for the board, for the community. I did want to mention one last thing I put on here kind of last second. Um, we have, since the launch of our feedback portal, uh, we've seen 147 um, suggestions, basically, um, which, is, which is good. I would anticipate, you know, we'll wind up being somewhere around the 300 mark, probably by the end of the budget season, maybe a little bit more. Um, we were at around 200 last year, so I think this is a good tool for folks to give us feedback. Uh, and just the highlights there, the top, all that's saying uh, is that the majority of the suggestions were related to instruction, which uh, is good, I think. The second largest uh, is the, 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 the bar there on the left is, um, uh, is salaries or benefits related. So those are, those are two of the main categories. Um, and then... Uh, uh, most of the suggestions are, are filtered into school leadership. And so the reason why I actually put that there, if you're, trying to, if you're asking, well, how do you aggregate 147 free-form comments, you know, this isn't bullets that they're selecting, they're writing a suggestion, is we, we, uh, we split those apart by the divisions. And so based on their feedback, we divide it up and we provide copies to the divisions to, to look at because they're now looking at their budgets. And so the feedback is giving them, you know, information as they consider what, what budget changes they want to make. And by and large, uh, te uh, teaching and learning has been the major recipient of that feedback. The majority of the, uh, of the feedback has been in areas that they would actually increase the budget, which is the challenge that the board faces, you know, uh, is, is balancing those things. Um, 
And then just the average rating there right at this point is, is, is we think is, is pretty good. So we're going to continue to update the board with this so you kind of know what the feedback, how that's going. Get a quick question yeah. on your timeline <clears throat> for uh, the two possible hearings on June the 16th. Yep. Can we change that time on the evening to 630 to be consistent with our <laughs> new schedule? Yes, sir. Okay. I had already made a note to, to okay. ask that question. Okay. Yeah, we, it, that meeting, particular meeting has to be after six, but oh, it could be it? 630. That's, okay. that's perfectly fine. Right. So, yeah, I was wondering if the board would prefer to do that just for consistency's sake. So, and then yeah. I just want to point out one thing you said. So as far as equalization goes, the risk that folks might have been under the, you know, thought that reducing the millage rate just by a little bit last year, we may not actually see a decrease. Well, is that, that is, is true. Okay. And it's true uh, because I will tell you that the impact of that will not be felt in FY21. Remember, there's a two-year lag. <clears throat> the way the formula is constructed, the, the, uh, the millage rate won't impact that formula till, till FY22. But when that time comes, it really depends on, 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 on the digest. And if we're in a growing period, you may not even see it. Right. Um, so it's, it is, it's difficult to, to predict what that impact is. You'd almost have to just assume everything stays stable and look two years from now and do the formula, calculate the number and see what the impact is. But that's not real life. Two years from now, the digest will have moved and changed, so yeah. But it won't affect 21, but it will affect 22 for sure. And I believe, Dr. Otak, that is all Mr. I Mr. Albright. <clears throat> okay. Um, this was several slides. Uh, this, uh, my question relates to several slides back. Uh, what was the time frame uh, for, the, uh, for the new housing starts, the new... Um, uh, uh, the the building permits. permits. What was your time frame on uh, picking that? Was that through the end of the year or last quarter or what was that? You know, I believe that's uh, as of uh, September. Or I'm sorry, it's, it's the first three quarters of, of 19. So we projected the last quarter of 19. Okay. Uh, which is a pretty reliable way to do that. So that really represented the what I would expect to be the full 19 year. Um, that there would be a that there's going to be a dip, a little bit of a dip. And, that, and I've met with the, um, the chief appraiser. That, that, is, that is an anomaly we've discussed, and I think everyone's aware of that. The building so permits have dropped. The philosophy of the, of, of the overall several times. And yeah, you know, is it, is, it, is it a temporary lag because of uh, inventory? Uh, I mean, look, so you can drive through the county and see, you know, we're not, we're not declining and, and, you know, growth is here and it's, it's it's, uh, it may just be a, a little bit of slack in the system because of inventory. That's right. been our conversations. Uh, I, just, I, I just didn't know if it was through the end of the year. It, it is, yeah. Okay. Projected through the end of the year. And, and I did have one question about the um, ESEP uh, enrollment growth as far as the greater cost. When you say 10% greater cost and 23% greater cost, that's above and beyond what we are reimbursed from the state for those students. As far as I know, sometimes if they're qualified with different um, you know, special needs, there may be funds associated with those needs. But this is, I'm trying to figure out if it's more like a gross greater cost or a net greater cost. Yeah, it is, uh, I mean, that's a good point. It is, um, uh, so you notice there's two bullets. The first bullet is local and state. So that is supplemented with state, it is. So, so when we say, uh, uh, I believe the number is 10%, that is not completely funded locally. It would follow generally uh, that two third rule again. So. Uh, about a third of that would, I would consider to be local, about two thirds kind of state. Uh, I think that's kind of a good rule of thumb. So that includes both. And to get to the 23%, you have to layer in title and, and uh, 6B, a lot of grants that drive that up to 23%. But that is not, I think that's your point, is that's not yeah, a I mean, burden on the district. Our funding is always behind. So people think, yes, we do, we may get a little more money for our ESEP students, but it's never enough to cover no. the entire cost of of educating them. It, it never is. And I, I'll tell you, the, the, those, that last little slide where I had the bullets and I talked about ESEP supporting that, it's, it's a real challenge. This pen will attest to that. I've, I have an estimate in there, but, you know, you're always trying to meet that need and you're always lagging behind it. You're always trying to catch up. Uh, it's just a challenge, especially for her and her team. So, yeah. I had two questions. You already answered one of them about the $2,000 teacher raise, uh, the impact of it. Uh, the second one is, is almost uh, to Eric. I noticed that you presented, you're showing a 2%, 2.2% student increase this year. 
if I remember correct, our study showed that we were going to have a 7% over a five or six year time frame. We're showing almost a 2%, which will, in, in the long run, in a five year time span, we're going to be up around 14% instead of 7%. Are we looking at our growth for our school expansions with a higher number than what we originally had in our, our, our study? That's yeah, go ahead, Eric. Sure. I know you guys are talking. But. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I, I, absolutely. And that's something that we constantly monitor. Um, and again, it, it could go up and it could also level off. But uh, we stay on top of that monthly with housing permits, growth, um, and just natural transiency. Yeah. But uh, yes, to answer your question. Thank you. I feel better. We, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to have to go through uh, building the school and end up with a school that's too small and, and still have to go back through yeah. this again. We're adjusting yeah. for size. Yeah. And I, uh, I, and at this point, I cheat. It's the back of the envelope kind of math. It's purely survival rate, just looking at cohorts moving up. Very simple. And I know the experts are coming behind me in a couple of weeks to really <laughs> drill in on like growth and the impact, the impact of all the school choice and stuff like that. So mine is, that's why it's probably maybe a little high. It may not be, but I suspect it's probably a little high. Uh, that number will get refined uh, by these guys in the next month or so. Can I ask you one request? When you, when you come back and do the, the full, uh, the, another one of these reports, when you calculate the, or when you're finding about the, uh, the, the new home starts and everything, um, is there any way that you could include in that uh, the existing home sales too? I have that, absolutely. I appreciate it. I already that. have that, yep. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Barnett. We, uh, we're going to take a five minute recess before we go. Uh, it's 10 07. Let's be back here at 10 12. <clears throat> Break, and we'll pick up on item uh, 6C efficiency study. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Otak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is a uh, These next five items are actually those that will be proposed to either appear on a consent agenda, the accident agenda, or um, uh, based on board discussion, uh, determining where these will fit in future meetings. The first item is RFP 20-191014 efficiency study. And to get a little bit of background, this is something that, of course, uh, the board has been talking about for several months. We started our discussion on scope in August the 13th at our meeting, presented a draft scope to our board on uh, 910. Uh, September 10th of this year, presented a finalized scope at the uh, October 8th meeting, and of course we posted an RFP and had a number of respondents. Uh, basically our recommendation or the recommendation uh, to the board to consider this morning is to award request proposal 20-191014, Educational Operational Efficiency Study to Gibson Consulting Group of Austin, Texas. This would be for an initial one, uh, phase one projection of the identifier, identification of major cost savings and budget review with the potential for additional phases with proven quality, performance, and price. So again, just to be clear, um, the initial award would be for only phase one, identification of major cost savings and budget review not to exceed $117,900. The other two phases, which would be optional and contingent upon uh, uh, quality service and performance, would be for an operational efficiency study. That would include a departmental approach, uh, reviewing our departments and their performance and efficiency. You can see the price uh, of that would be 265,000 basically. Phase three would be the other focus um, in hearing from the board is looking at an educational efficiency study. That's looking at programs and services offered to students for the same value. So again, I'll open that up for discussion, but again, that is RFP uh, 20191014, Education and Operational Efficiency Study. Well, I'll start out and say that I do not see the need for this is efficiency study. We have so much data to support that we are an outstanding school district and we run an efficient uh, district. And this is um, kind of going back and doing 
the same thing that we have had done over and over and over. And you look at our accreditation and you look at all of the, the, the things that we have in our, as far as budget and you look at all of the data as far as uh, our uh, the, uh, testing data and graduation rate and all the things that we're doing and the budget. We have an extremely efficient, I think there's a lot of money that we're trying to spend, that we're about to spend on proving that we're doing what we're doing. So that's my opinion. And that's the same opinion I've had since the beginning of the recommendation of the study. I don't think it's necessary. Anyone else? Mr. Dean? Yes, I have to agree and disagree uh, with my colleague. Um, I think the efficiency study is needed. Uh, I do not think that um, this is the right way to go because of sort of like our chairman has said time and time again, we do not need a study to study our studies to study our studies and continue on forever. Uh, my concern was when I saw the quotes, the vast spread of the quotes, I'm afraid that our, our needs requirements within the RFP was not clearly defined. <clears throat> and I recommend we table it until we go back and review uh, where we're at on the, the study. Is it in the it, it's, set of motion? Uh, no, we're not. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're, we're discussing if we if we can we can table it. But just keep in mind, if we table it, it won't come back at a night meeting. It would be one month from today. It would be at a morning meeting because what we're doing now is discussing whether or not we want to put this on the agenda for an action item for the first meeting of February. Um, I, I agree um, with that. I, when I looked at the overall cost, we had initially budgeted a hundred thousand dollars, which phase one is is pretty close. I mean, it's it's one hundred and seventeen nine. Um, but the overall cost is what bothers me, the 647.7, because if they were to do an analysis and find out we were, you know, $500,000, for example, inefficient, then we spent more than that trying to show us that we're inefficient. And so I think by that, that would make us inefficient spending, you know, $1.1 $1 million. So um, going back to what Mr. Chester said earlier about a committee, I would almost rather appoint a committee to be on top of this um, if we decide to go that route because I just think $650,000 is a lot of money to tell us something we should probably already know. Go ahead. A quick follow-up and a question to Tom. Can we assign a person as a, onto a working group and not call it a committee? As long as you don't have, if you, you have a, if, if the chairman appoints a committee of the board, then that then committee is subject to the Open Meetings Act. But any individual or even group of individuals, as long as you don't have a quorum, <coughs> could certainly attend functions and attend meetings and you know, other pre presentations and things like that if they choose to, without it being a committee uh, of the board. But there would be no requirement that they would be there. Uh, they wouldn't report necessarily it, back. It would, be a, it would be a commitment to... To just, be there, just be your volunteer. You yeah. just be volunteering, to and be that there. sort of gets back to what Nick was saying earlier too. Miss Cobb, um, I, I do think we need to. We are the checks and balances of the district with the governing body. I do think we need to be uh, do that checks and balances every once in a while, not not maybe every year, or as Mr. Chester had mentioned, maybe you do a little bit each year. Um, I don't think we need to do something of, of this scope like the range was um like mr dean mentioned the range was just very large and i know when we first discussed this if i said if at all possible i would like to see some of these companies maybe a, an example of something they've done in the past so that we see what our results will be and therefore um we won't be paying one hundred thousand or six hundred thousand for something that doesn't give us the answers we need but um, i do think we're very efficient i think we have a good star rating but at the same time there is always room for improvement and we have we have got to verify where we are and have a baseline so that we can continue to improve and i think we we owe our taxpayers en enough to verify <clears throat> and show because some some people don't believe we're efficient so we we need to to be able to show that we are mr chair if i could take a moment um to just share uh, the committee i want you to know put a great deal of time and effort into this and as i mentioned in my friday flyer to you guys 
the actual documents themselves, we will provide hard drives. Um, some of these reports were in excess of 600 pages that included samples, the type of work they were doing. We will provide those to you um, so that you can review those and see. I believe that if I had to give an overall uh, feedback from the board was, or from the committee was one, you know, just looking at the quality of the product of the output um, is a huge difference in the providers that responded. Um, it was the most thorough, you know, the ability to, to manage a project of this size and scope. So I just wanted you to know that this committee spent a great deal of time reviewing each of these applicants to determine following interviews of three select who they felt would be best suited to meet the needs of the district. But I, I do understand and we will get, um, try to get them to you today if we can, Mr. Barnett, those last <coughs> drives for all board members so they can look at each of the six proposals. Um, here's, here's what we Does can that do. Include the RFP? Yeah. Because that's the basis. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll resend that out to everybody. Before I say something, Mr. Albright, did you have a comment? Yeah, just that uh, the cost of this study, given the uh, given the size of this organization, is uh, where it might be on the high side of normal, slightly, is well. well within what I would have expected for an organization this size. <laughs> the issue, and I'll kind of touch on a little bit of everybody's stuff here, but the, the issue um, here with the efficiency study is uh, um, it is one of uh, transparency, I think, is probably the primary, uh, the primary function of doing this. And so um, if we're wanting to be transparent, and let's face it, uh, and I've experienced this, I think we were all here uh, a couple of budgets ago when, um, uh, when there were some serious questions. Uh, well, but there were a lot of questions and a lot of, uh, a lot of upset uh, about whether or not we are handling the budget. If there is uh, money to be, uh, I apologize, uh, money uh, to be found elsewhere. And so, um, <coughs> There is always the possibility that an organization this large, um, that there are going to be inefficiencies. I can guarantee you there are inefficiencies. It's, you know, it's just there, just a reality. The question is, uh, do we want to find those efficiencies? And yes, we would be running a risk uh, that, uh, that any inefficiencies that would be found uh, and correct and potentially corrected would eventually um, be uh, be equal to the cost of doing the analysis, and so when you mix all of that together, uh, you know the, the 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 biggest question of transparency I think has to be the deciding factor. Um, and moving <coughs> forward, as I stated last year, uh, uh, that uh, this year's budget was going to be more challenging than last year's, and next year's budget is going to be far more challenging than this year's. That's just the way, that's just a reality that we're gonna be looking at. And so the question of, are we being as good a stewards as we possibly could be, is gonna be a question that's gonna be coming in our faces, okay? Now look, am I a fan of dropping 600 grand for nothing? Never. Don't even, <laughs> that, that, is, that is a non-starter issue, okay? But, um, but we've also got to keep in mind that, uh, that the public, the people that put us here, um, uh, for whatever reason, are going to want a certain level of transparency in what we're presenting to them. And unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of options for us to present to them what the facts are. And if somebody else has got a better idea of being able to get third party proof then I'm all ears, but um, but this is the standard practice and procedure for for doing those things. So um, uh, I think the uh, the phases here, uh, the phase one identifying things. I'll be honest with you, I don't know exactly how they're going to get into phase one without actually getting into phase two. 
<laughs> I think it's the precursor. It's yeah. gonna, you know, I, I mean, I understand there, you know, the phase one is sort of a precursor to say, okay, hey, these are all some great ideas that we need to go and look at, uh, you know, specifically related to <laughs> our district, okay? Uh, and that's fine. Uh, but, um, but I think we need to keep in mind that if we're spending the 117 nine, you know, there's no sense in spending that hundred thousand dollars if we're not going to be all in. We don't need to do this halfway. Either we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. But doing it halfway is going to be a waste of money. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to share. Um, I'd written some comments down based on committee feedback. One of the other pieces I'd like to add is, as part <coughs> of Gibson's proposal, they also indicated that this would be one model of approaching the. Uh, the efficiency study, but they could it basically be what the district, how they would work with it, which could be as little as 16 months or as long as six years, depending on the need and financial resources. So again, it's all depending on how we want to approach and move forward. Right. And of course, in, six, in five or six years, if that's what it takes, start all over again with a whole new efficiency. Study. Mr. Chester. Yeah, I, I'd just say that I think it's a good start. I'd, I'd just say for the public and remind my colleagues, it's about the process. Um, every employee of the district has an annual review. Superintendent has an annual review. Um, I get physical every year. You know, sometimes that <laughs> probe is deeper than I would like. <laughs> but it's a process to see where you are in get better and this will not be perfect it will not be <clears throat> probably what the majority of us would would like but it's process it's putting in place a system for the district to review itself by the outside party and take that information to improve and i and i know that's all what we want but you know process so thank you i i agree with that i um the only issue you know, for me, and I've got to wrap my head around it, is I agree with doing the study. But when you look at us six months ago and we're talking about 12 schools that didn't have air condition in their kitchen and the cost was about 800 and something thousand dollars to fix it, you know, were we efficient to spend $647,000 on somebody to tell us how to do something better when we've already found something that needed to be fixed and it's $150,000 more than this. So that's where I've got to wrap my head around, is it okay spending the money um, when you know we have a need that affects our staff and these schools and affects our students. Um, but I'm not saying that I'm against it. I'm saying that I've just got to wrap my head around it a little bit tighter. Um, so at this point, Mr. Dean, before you make a comment, uh, we need to uh, figure out, I want a kind of a general consensus if you want to go ahead and put this on the agenda for the first meeting of February, or do we need to table it and have one more discussion at the end of February and put it on the first meeting in March? Can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, so I, I, my position is I'm supportive of doing an efficiency study. Um, I know today we would be um, voting on an amount of $117,000 roughly. Um, I get the entire scope. Um, from my vantage point, the number one thing I constantly hear um, from citizens is questioning, how are we spending our money? lack of trust of the government. And the third thing is, if there are systemic issues in this school district, why are they not being fixed? And I'm not gonna get on a tangent about um, all of the challenges we face, but if for example, and I know we're gonna talk about it during board comments, if we have special needs issues and we can't fund them or come up with a plan to address them, are we gonna to continue to spin our wheels without knowing where are the opportunities to fix those problems? And this district will never fix those problems. And this is a, this is a difficult decision, but this is why we get elected. Um, so I just challenge all of you, um, you know, I don't think today or in February, we're talking about going and spending $647,000. I think we're talking about spending roughly $100,000 and I think, you know, we work with the staff and figure out, okay, what are these phase twos and phase threes and Ms. Cobb's point? You know, what does the data collection look like? What are the expectations? Um, 
And, you know, I'm sure there's um, more discussion that needs to have on that. Um, but, you know, I agree with what you're saying, Mr. Chairman, about the air conditioned units and, and those types of things. Um, but one thing I don't think we can take away from what Mr. Albright said is this district is going to continue to go from number 12 to number 11 to number 10. And if we don't start hitting this stuff head on now, um, we're going to continue to fall behind or will fall behind in the quality education. I think the six, seven, on, on, and everybody, every staff member in here and the citizens expect of us as a district. So um, that's my two cents. But um, I think we need to come up with a palatable way to, I think, move forward with um, the action of um, this item um, to really get a true sense of kind of where where are we headed as a as a district, kind of to your point, um, Mr. Chairman. So um, that's that's my from my vantage point. But um, from talking to the citizens I've talked to, um, you know, and I hear from about you know potential you know opportunities um, within our school district. I think the public has an expectation that something like this is done. I'm not saying that this is perfect, but I think um, we need to figure out the roadmap to move forward. Thank you. Mr. Dean. <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've had the, I don't know if you'd call it the privilege or curse to facilitate uh, two, possibly three events almost this size, the F-22 moving to Fort Worth being one of those. Uh, first of all, there's a misconception. Our budget will not go down because we do an efficiency study and we save money. It will add capacity to what we already have and we will be able to do things like special needs. It's, it, it's a common misconception that if we do an efficiency study, we're gonna do it better and we're gonna reduce our taxes. That's, that's not how the efficiency study works. It's, we're not gonna be laying people off. Uh, I am a very strong advocate for doing this. My reason for bringing this up is I wanna make sure, like Jason said, we're gonna be growing and we need to make sure that we've got this right the first time when we go into it. And that's that's my point. The only other comment, just to highlight a data point, Mr. Chairman, um, just one step further to Mr. Albright's point is, I mean, we are a, a organization of 3,400 and something employees, which is equivalent to the size of many Fortune 100 and 500 companies across the country, many of them based here in the state of Georgia. Um, and so I just want to put that in perspective that um, being such a large organization, um, you know, tied to tax dollars, um, I do think there is an extra level of, um, of uh, critique, an extra level of um, uh, scrutiny we should put ourselves under um, to that fact. So um, I just want to add that data point. Mr. Chairman, if I could take a minute, I, I had put down some points of feedback from uh, the RFP committee. And I just want to take a second to go through them so you guys know the level of work and the feedback that they provided. One, they felt uh, this I'm sorry, before you do that, I did have a question about time frame, um, Mr. Chairman, in terms of tabling it and decision. Um, is that something <clears throat> we have to do in March or is there? No, this is planning on going on the agenda for the first meeting in February. Okay. So unless, unless you, you all tell me now that you want to wait, it's, it's going on the agenda for the first meeting in um, February. I'm sorry, in February, yeah. February 10th. Okay. That was my February 10th. Right. I'm sorry, 11th. We're not actually voting to approve today. No, this is no. discussion only. Um, and we'll have copies of all of the proposals to you before you leave today. But just again, uh, the committee felt they had the most thorough response, the cl most cl closely matched the request, especially in the area of educational efficiency. They had the management capabilities to complete a project of the size and scope, the reporting capabilities of a project of this size and scope. Uh, they do have other added values that they can bring to the organization if we so desire. As I mentioned, this is fairly modular in terms of how we would progress over time. Uh, again, the proposal you have here, um, uh, and you will see in the proposals as you read, this is something that can also be broken up over time. They had K-12 references, again, very large districts, Los Angeles, Savannah, Las Vegas, uh, that they've done this type of work with. Um, and they also are in that, again, the K-12 market. Their timeline was reasonable. Uh, 
the consultants performed the work to review efficiencies and best practice in providing the date and also providing data required. Um, these are just some of the uh, items that they picked out. And, and again, I want to thank this committee because this was really um, a lot of time went into this on their part, reading through these proposals, as you'll see when you review them. But again, uh, I just wanted to take a minute to uh, share some of the feedback from the r and committee. All right, and also just keep in mind, Mr. Chester, <clears throat> this, this uh, new style of meeting is so we can get our, kind of like what you said earlier, we can get all our questions out now. So when we open this up for a vote and we have discussion at that first meeting in February, we don't need to sit here and have another 45 minute talk about it. So that's why we're here today. And so I would encourage anybody between now and that first meeting to email their questions to Dr. Otot or you know, have an offline discussion with him um, because that, that would defeat the purpose of, of rehashing this now to try to rehash it again right before the vote. Go ahead. Just a real quick comment. Uh, one of those events <coughs> I had the privilege to do was uh, Rockwell International Missile System Di Division, the entire division. We did a top-down analysis, and it was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in nineteen ninety-five. So, actually, the price is not that far out. No, I, I. All right. Anyone else before we move on? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to um, item D. So, Mr. Chairman, we'll place that on the action agenda yes. for our February eleventh meeting. <clears throat> Uh, next is RFQC 20-191213, construction manager at risk. Um, again, uh, the, the scope of the RFQC was for three projects. I wanted to take a minute to talk through that with the board. Um, our past practice had been that we, we would take all projects within a five-year period and place them in one proposal of this nature. One of the things that we're looking at is making smaller groupings of projects for our construction manager at risk. This would be the first of those. This would be for the Moses Middle School Edition, uh, renovations and modifications, the Resum Elementary School Edition, renovations and modifications, as well as Hiram High School Editions, renovations, modifications. The uh, recommendation of the committee would be to recommend RK Redding Construction of Bremen, Georgia. Basically, um, for for the board also a, a bit of additional detail um, for purposes of the proposal the projects were estimated at a 16 million dollar but we would bring forth to you contracts for each individual proposal so that you'd have an opportunity to see the cost associated but again that would be our recommendation rk reading uh, construction uh, out of bremen georgia on the the uh, proposal evaluations, your A5 intangibles, and I just realized how ludicrous this question is going to be. What do you define as intangibles? <laughs> Eric, do you? Undefined items. What do you define as undefined items? <laughs> yeah, and that's a great question. So uh, like any vendor, they always bring um, extra value adds uh, is another way of saying intangibles. Uh, what is their investment not only in the school district, not only in saving value, uh, in a monetary sense, but also in the value that they provide our staff and uh, in our schools. I, I feel very comfortable just knowing that knowing what the intangibles probably would have been. The top three bids were so close together that it was unreal and uh, untan intangible value that they brought is there was not such a spread like we had on our last topic. So I felt comfortable with this. <coughs> Okay, nothing further. We'll go ahead and place that on the action agenda <clears throat> for February. Can I ask one just point of information? Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Um, let me pull it up. And this may be just a um, big, picker, big picture question, but I know we're talking about the three schools at hand, um, and I know the public will probably ask, um, I know we've talked about Russell and we've talked yes. about Moses. Um, the question will probably be asked, what about Roberts? Because I know Roberts was asked. So can we just, as much as we can, just timing, why just, because I think that is a question we will be asked by parents at Rob, Roberts, Abney, um, as this information kind of starts getting out in the community. Right. I'll just um, go ahead and ask that. No. If, if you're okay, if, if yeah. I respond. Please. Uh, we find that our two most critical addition projects are Russum and Moses. 
Roberts is still in consideration, but we do feel like we need a little bit of time to see how the enrollment trends go in that community. Um, we've done some initial site work and everything else on that, so we would not be necessarily behind uh, uh, behind timeline if we felt like we needed Roberts at this point. But absolutely, we just want to give that one a little bit more time. We want to evaluate some of the development that's in that area. But the two projects that are on here are ones that we see as the most critically in need. We will be um, looking at our next phases. I would say we would have a timeline of that sometime in June and July for next steps on other projects. Okay, no, that's helpful. I, I just know that's gonna be a point of discussion as all this entire growth process sure. has been, so thank you. Real, real quick, is there possibilities of running dual contracts with different contractors on different projects? In other words, do these three and then have another contractor working on Robert's um, is that going to be too much management for our, it's a lot it's, it's, a lot, it's possible know. but yes it's a lot a lot more stress on our current infrastructure to have to deal with multiple companies multiple financial patterns and things like that okay. all right mr chairman then we will add that to our action agenda for our february 11th meeting uh, we have two policy revisions mr magger if you'd come forward this is first reading of policy uh, revisions to policy BCBD board meeting agendas as well as revisions to policy BCBK executive sessions mr. Maggart yeah um, do a little house cleaning here with uh, BCBD board meeting agendas uh, we had to strike the language from that policy because if you'll recall uh, several months ago we updated uh, Board of Education policy BCBI regarding public participation at board meetings uh, as you know now for non agenda items uh, people can request uh, no later than 24 hours prior to the board meeting at which they would like to speak or, or if it's an agenda item they can come uh, the day of the board meeting to speak so we just simply struck that language because it's no longer applicable and mr. chairman if no objections I'd recommend we place this on the February 11th consent agenda We'll go ahead Next one about. is uh, policy BCBK executive sessions. Again, a little house cleaning, as you recall, uh, several months ago, um, matters pertaining to school and district safety and security uh, can be discussed in executive sessions, and we just needed to reflect that in our policy. And again, with this one, Mr. Chairman, if there are no objections, I would recommend this being placed on the February 11th consent agenda. Right. Yeah. Any questions? I would like to say, you know, I know we get a lot of questions about safety and security, but, you know, just to reiterate before when we've had issues with that, we, there's some things that we need to discuss back there and not publicly right. so that, you know, we know where we stand and you don't want to show all your cards and, and make it easier for someone to do something they shouldn't be doing. So that, that was the reason for doing that, um, keeping some of that information back there. And, and just to add a little layer onto that, actually, I think one of uh, House Bill 74, I think that's the correct number, uh, was passed, I think, both uh, committees, and that would further clarify the open records um, and allowing some additional safety-related discussion to occur in executive. Um, uh, item G is asset disposal. It's here for review. Um, if there are no questions, again, this, Mr. Chairman, this is one I'd recommend being placed on the consent agenda for our February 11th, 2020 meeting. Yes, that'll be fine. And then just to clarify, so items under section six, that'll be under a consent agenda would be E, F, and G? Yes. Okay. So just everyone keep in mind that E, F, and G will be one presented for one vote. At our February 11th right. meeting, that's right. Okay. Okay. Well, if we're ready to move on, uh, one of the things that uh, is very exciting is what's happening with STEM in Paulding County. Sarah Graham uh, is our STEM coordinator, and I would just like to take a moment to thank Sarah. Uh, she does a phenomenal job of not only working with STEM, but also communicating the great things that are going on in STEM in our county. And Sarah has an update of where we are and a little peek forward into the future. So Sarah, if you'd come on forward and share uh, what's going on in STEM. Absolutely. Good morning. Good morning. I am excited to share some things with you. Um, you've probably seen, if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen lots of things going on in the district with STEM. <laughs> I don't mind that nickname, I don't. <laughs> All right, so just to update our progress so far this year, 
Um, it's amazing what we've done. Um, I look back and when I gather all of this information together, it just, it's just phenomenal what our teachers and students are doing. Um, and then to share just a little bit about what's upcoming for 2021. Okay, I'm gonna just kind of tell you this little quote that I heard recently, and I can't even remember where I heard it from, so I hope I'm not misquoting someone. Um, but I think about STEM in this respect, we're not teaching students just to do something. We're teaching them to do anything. And that's reflecting what we're doing as far as getting them ready to be career and college ready. Um, so just to look, <coughs> this works, right? Yeah. Okay, just to talk a, a little bit about what is STEM education. Okay, we can integrate STEM, we can talk about STEM or say we're doing STEM, but what we wanna do in Pauling County is to have a true STEM education program. And this was one of the ways that I saw that it was reflected very well. STEM integrates and applies math and science to create technologies and solutions to real world problems by using the engineering design approach. So that's what we're trying to do. And it's a big change for our teachers and our students. And I wanted to just talk about these little pictures right here. Some of you have been to the Spartan Swamp, I do believe, right? Okay, so this is South Pauling High School students and they are working on STEM certification. And a big part of that is their swamp. Okay, so there's a big giant swamp behind South Pauling High School. And they go out in waders, they go out and collect data, and they enter the data into devices like this. Okay, so in their science class, in their environmental class, they're collecting data. Then they go back in and connect this to the computer and send it to their math teacher. So they're doing real world math. So this is, what, this is our vision. This is what we wanna see kids doing because it reflects what they're gonna be doing in the real world. Okay, so this, is, this as you can imagine, takes time uh, to do those pieces. Okay, then just to talk about our vision, which kind of reflects what I just said. Um, this vision was developed by, first by our STEM leadership folks, and then I went to administrators, teachers, and kind of got feedback on it. But our vision is for STEM education in the Pauling County School District is to prepare all students to be innovative thinkers by providing active learning, an active learning environment that includes critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. So it covers all of those four C's that um, all of pretty much the STEM world wants them to, to, to be doing. Okay. This slide reflects something that I've been following for a few years. And it's from the economic, uh, this World Economic Forum. And it's what employers are looking for in students. Okay, if you notice, there's lots of problem solving. There's lots of things, and you see like the trend between 2020 and 2022 is huge. That's what we have to get our kids ready for and STEM is gonna help us do that. Um, research indicates that we're kind of on that cusp or almost in it of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and that is where smart technologies, and you guys know that with internet of things and, and all of those things that we're seeing are gonna change the way that we live, work, and relate to each other. And our kids need to be ready for that. Um, so the skills look at outlook kind of reflects that piece as well. And you notice it's not those hard skills it's those soft skills. And when I talk to people in the, business, in the business world, a lot of them say we can teach them those hard skills, but they need to learn those soft skills before they get there because those are ingrained in them. So that's what we wanna do. And to kind of reflect our local economy, I am working on doing a skills outlook for Pauling County School District. Um, so hopefully I can update you on that the next time I talk to you uh, once I get that in. All right, so next I just wanted to go through each of our goals for our STEM strategic plan and just tell you where we are and kind of where we're going. Um, all right, the first goal is STEM certification. Okay, that was one of the pieces that we wanted to start to begin to work on. Um, so in, at the high school level, we would like to see within the next five years, three high schools certified. And we do have those three in the pipeline right now. Others are working on some things too, so we may have more, but I have three this year that I'm working with. Um, middle schools, 
Uh, we're looking at one program for sure within the next five years and possibly more to come on. I feel like once we get that one, it's going to be a model for the rest and it's just going to kind of flow in that way. In elementary, we have one right now that's in the pipeline, but we know that additional are going to come on. We really invested, and you guys have approved that and, and supported that, that investment in elementary schools that I'll talk about in a minute as well. So I know that that's going to come along too. Um, so what we're looking at here um, is that Pauling County High School recertifies in 2022. I was there yesterday, an amazing program. I can't wait. I wish we could recertify tomorrow because they're ready. Okay, they're that close. Um, South Paulding High School began their first cohort this year, which they are coming along really fast. It's kind of like that model, like I said, they're looking at Paulding County High School, not necessarily modeling exactly what they're doing, but that process is moving faster. Um, Hiram High School will start with them. I'm already starting to work with their teachers on project-based learning and how that looks. So they'll hit the ground running with that computer science academy and move on um, through STEM certification process with that. Uh, Rich Middle School, um, they began their first sixth grade cohort this year and then it'll roll to seventh and then to eighth and then work on that full school certification. Um, and McGarity Elementary started the process in 2017 and I visited with them yesterday and they are so excited. And I would say maybe a year, year and a half out from that being a reality for them. Um, so additional schools, talking to them in the process, you know, with that new STEM budget that they have, they're all excited. And we're talking about a difference between STEM immersion and STEM integration with standards. So we're STEM immersed, we've got it going, okay? And we're working with teachers and that's a huge part because this is a big paradigm shift from going to teaching an individual thing to integrating things. So that's been a big piece of what we've worked on this year. Um, so let me move to goal two because I think I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, okay. goal, two, goal two was integrating in daily experiences and the pieces there were K-12 increasing professional learning opportunities, supporting STEM ex extracurricular activities, um, that K-12 STEM budget, and uh, middle school transition of family consumer science to a STEM CTA e-course, and that's gonna take place over several years. Um, and then in elementary school, funding a half-time STEM exploratory teacher at all elementary schools. Um, so where we are there, the STEM cohort, we have a STEM cohort that we created, and that's a district level. So you have an elementary, middle, and high. So those teachers get together, plan, get through um, some different pieces. But we also have a multi-district collaboration uh, through an innovation cohort with KSU and Cobb STEM. So we have 10 teachers that are going through that as well, bringing back, working with other people so that we can kind of uh, gather knowledge from them as well. As a matter of fact, um, the Cobb Innovation Cohort for high school is at Paulding County High School right now, learning from Paulding County High School. So we're kind of sharing those pieces and it's kind of exciting to be able to do that. Um, then we also have our Tech Ed's STEM edition with KSU I Teach, And that's another piece that we are able to um, kind of build teachers and take, so give them things in the engineering design process and project-based learning that they can take directly back to their classroom and use. So it's not that we're just feeding into them, they're learning things that they can take back and use immediately. Um, and those STEM budgets, they have been a huge piece of being able to get this on the ground and running. So we're working through that. Um, then goal three, is computer science. Okay, so we're really excited because we're like way ahead of the game as far as where the state wants us to be. I'm sure you've heard of um, SB 108, which requires that all middle and high schools have computer science integrated by 24 or 25. <laughs> they kept changing the date, I had to check that to be sure. Uh, but we definitely have that piece working through our K-12 curriculum. Um, and we want to increase the number of teachers also in the computer science endorsement and certification. So at high school right now, uh, we have a, a complete AP computer science pathway at North Paulding High School, and Hiram High School Academy of Computer Science is opening next year, so we're all really excited about that. And then in middle school, Dobbins Middle School and Rich Middle School have been a pilot with one of our GOSA grants 
um, implementing computer science this year. And then with a, an additional grant that we received this year um, from CS4GA, Computer Science for Georgia, uh, we are transitioning the remaining seven middle schools next year from business classes to full computer science. Okay, and then at the elementary level, we have coding and fundamental computer science integrated through the STEM exploratory classes. And we want to continue and grow that as well. Um, then our computer science endorsement, which is exciting. Last night, Jenna and I started teaching our very first cohort here in Paulding, Thank you for doing it. <laughs> which is huge. And, and we have other districts coming into us, but it also has our teachers as well. And it is, it, it was really a very good night. We were there till, at Dwick till about nine o'clock last night with them. Mm. But, um, you know, and some of them drove as far as two hours away and were excited about computer science when they left. So we were really excited about that and being able to um, provide that. Uh, let's see. So our plan will have us completely compliant well before 2425. So we're talking within the next couple of years, we'll have everything completely compliant with that. So we're excited to be way ahead of the game and um, being a leader in that area in the state. Okay, goal four are our district initiatives. And for that, um, for K-12, we want to support the STEM initiatives through the growth of the um, STEM STEAM Resource Development Innovation Lab. That's a mouthful, we just call it the Innovation Lab. Um, but the grant that I received was that full big name, but now I think it's just kind of evolved into the Innovation Lab. And then increased communication through STEM initiatives. That Innovation Lab, although it started with that initial grant, has grown because parts of the STEM budget that, that I have received kind of go to help maintain and grow that piece. And the beauty of it is that partnership with KSU I Teach. We were teaching teachers how to use instructional technology, but then having to tell them, well, we can't provide that for you. You know, you don't have, you'll have to go to your school and figure that out, you know, or, or work with your principal. Now we have a place that they can come and check those things out. And this is our second year in operation and extremely successful. Um, we even opened up a second spot for drop off and pick up because we were noticing that in the northern part of the county, because the innovation labs at DWIC in the northern part of the county, it, um, checkouts were not very, there weren't many. And there were some schools that didn't check out at all last year. So we fixed that. There is not a school that hasn't checked out from us this year. So we're really excited about that piece. And then communication, <coughs> I'm really great on Twitter working on the Facebook and, and all of those different pieces <laughs> to make sure getting them all tied together. Um, and then I'm working really hard to establish those business relationships because not only is that important to STEM certification, it's just important to our kids uh, that they have that real world experience and have those people coming in to see them doing those things. Okay, so for our upcoming priorities for each goal, for STEM certification, we're, I would like to continue um, what I'm doing, supporting STEM and STEAM and um, helping those that are seeking STEM certification and start to pull more in um, and increase the, that number. And goal two, two with the integrated daily experiences, continue the STEM budget. I think that's important for them to continue to try to build and, can, and keep up with that. Um, and continue the district STEM budget to support all of the PL pieces that are in place and uh, to prepare that first group of family consumer science schools, East Pauley Middle School, Rich Middle School, and Scoggins to transition <clears throat> in the 21-22 school year. And then to possibly increase the number of STEM exploratory teachers at the elementary school level. Um, and then goal three, uh, K-12 computer science, continue that support there. We have you know, lots of things in there for um, grant-wise that's gonna help with that. And then our district initiatives, adding resources to the innovation lab, um, continuing those communication pieces and to strengthen community and post-secondary relationships. So by the numbers, because that's really what we want to look at, right? <laughs> so uh, the district STEM budget, uh, that would not increase. Um, I did receive $25,000 this year to help with those efforts. Um, the school STEM budgets, that was where we had $5 per student, but with no school under $3,000 because 
you know, some schools would only qualify for about $1,500, which isn't a lot when you're dealing with STEM pieces. So that would not increase, but say at about $155,000, um, increase the number of STEM exploratory teachers. Right now, when we hired the three last year, they split 10 schools. So we have two teachers with three and one with four. That one with four for sure, it, it's, it's a challenge to make sure they get to all the students and is not in the number of times. So um, it, within what I'm requesting is saying one would be approximately $70,000. And I put the amounts there for two and three, if we could, <laughs> if, if that was possible. Um, we know that that's, that that's an iffy thing um, with the budget. But um, professional learning would be about $19,000. And the rest of those pieces are, um, dealing with the computer science piece that's rolling out, uh, the monitors and computers for, and for the computer science labs for that transition of middle school, about 26-8. Um, high school, that is all of the funding for starting that academy, and parts of that are district, parts of that are um, CRE grants. And then the Paulding County High School and Hiram High School transportation is approximately $49,000 for that transportation for those two academies. And uh, then the uh, middle school family consumer science transition um, for the construction for those three schools would be about $30,000. And then the technology, $45,000 per school, which would be covered by CRE grants. Okay. So my last thing I want to leave you with is that all things are not, are all investments are not monetary. These are just some of the people we've worked with this year. And then at McGarity yesterday, when they did their STEM reflection, I realized they've had 16 partnerships over the last three years that they've worked with. So that's huge. And some of them were those people on that list, some of them were not. So there's lots of partnerships and things going on that I don't even know about. Uh, so that is huge. And I'm going to start working with leadership polling very closely to start to develop some of those as well. Okay, so again, I just kind of remind you, we're not teaching them to do something or something. We're teaching, we're not teaching them to do, <laughs> <laughs> I've lost it. Uh, not teaching them to do something. We're teaching them to do anything. Any of those jobs that are going to be out there. Thank so, you. Uh, and I know there may be questions, but I <laughs> yes. want to thank Sarah. And no offense, Mr. Barnett, but I don't know if it's because you're STEM coordinator. You're the only one who could work the slide <laughs> projector no, this you. morning. I don't know if there's any <laughs> relationship there. There's a lot of information, a lot of great yes. things going on with STEM in our schools. I would also like to let you know that Leadership Polling 30 um, visited the STEM Innovation Lab, and I've heard more from them um, just excited about what kids are interacting with, the types of equipment kids are using. It was really a positive experience. I know there's a lot in her presentation, um, but I'd also like to once again thank you, Sarah. You've taken yes. this and ran with it this year. Thank you. And uh, really are so supportive of our schools. But, thank you I for mean, the opportunity. Any questions? Yeah, I, I just want to say um, thank you because you can see your excitement in, in that as well. What um, soft skills was something I picked up on, which I think is extremely important because I know when we're sending um, our work-based learning students, thankfully yes. get some soft skills, but a lot yes. of students don't get to participate in that. At what age, I mean, I could even see that trying to be initiated earlier. Do you have any ideas as to what age we can try to start doing soft skills that we used to learn 30 years ago that the kids have no idea about now? Absolutely, through project-based learning. Um, that's going all the way down to kindergarten is okay. what I'm saying now. And with our STEM exploratory teachers, especially in those classes, it's amazing. I mean, they are working in groups. They're learning how to share. <laughs> They're learning how to um, code and all of those different things. So those pieces are definitely all the way down to elementary. And that's part of that project-based learning process that I'm working with teachers to help develop them so they can develop the students. Okay, thank you. So, go ahead, Mr. Chester. Uh, when you get opportunity, can we get some additional information on the transportation piece? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I just have one comment um, for Dr. Otot. I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, and Sarah, but there's a lot of companies like Ernest & Young um, here in Atlanta, here in Georgia, that are looking to partner with school districts. Um, you would actually probably guess that the op number of opportunities is pretty ramp it and particularly with the larger school districts um, and a lot of the fortune 100s and fortune fortune fives um, actually struggle even working with the bigger counties 
So there may be an opportunity for y'all, um, and I would encourage this to go sit down with our new economic di development director who used to sit on one of my boards, Michael Hughes, and go through this presentation and challenge Michael um, to help even bridge some of those relationships because obviously that would help, you know, with his, you know, the, the pressure he's going to be under to bring jobs to this county. Um, but try and find ways to um, have these discussions and um, larger settings with larger business audiences um, around the metro region um, oh, so they're exposed to what we're doing here in um, Paulding County but I know there's a lot of companies that are asking how can we get involved in STEM um, in the larger counties it's there's a lot more bureaucracy there's a lot more get into a whole lot of reasons why there's there's barriers so I think it's an opportunity for us to to seize on the momentum that all of you have placed on us but I want to thank you Sarah and Dr. Yeah, Otot and the rest of the staff for everything y'all have done to take this to where you've brought it in such a short amount of time and the board well, thank you all for the opportunity so we move into our final two items this morning under communication and engagement we do have a point of information here on uh, fundraiser reports so if there are any questions we'd be glad to answer those if not our final item today is under cultivating retaining high quality professionals I've asked uh, Ms. White to provide you an update of where we are in terms of a human resources report. This is probably our busiest time of year in human resources because we are already gearing up for staffing for FY21. So Ms. White, if you could provide us just a bit of an update on where we are at HR. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Dr. Otot said, of course, we're just entering the second half of 1920, but with human resources, we're charged with looking at staffing for 2021. So to that, we began with our certified letters of intent, and you'll see all the dates listed here on your um, the graphic that's provided. The letters of intent were initially sent on, on January 13th, and that window just closed on Friday. We did have a great return on our certified staff members responding to that. Um, with that, they have to tell us whether or not they're going to return, resi resign, or retire. So that kind of gives us um, a, a look into what we need to pre prepare for in terms of hiring. We go from there where we'll be opening up our voluntary transfer window. That will open on February 10th and go through February 21st. And that's for just for those um, staff members who are list looking to go into a different building. With that voluntary transfer request, it's for lateral moves that going from building to building. Um, we go from there to where our administrators are providing us staff recommendations, and those are the um, certified staff members that we will be bringing to you guys on February the 11th to approve for them to have contracts going into the 2021 school year. Of course, um, if you guys approve that, when we'll be handing contracts out at the school level on February 12th, so our staff members will have from the 12th through the 25th to get those completed and return to their uh, building level administrators. Um, our goal is to make sure that we know our real numbers before we have our big job fair that we'll be having on March 5th um, that will be at PB Rich Middle School. We are doing the in-district transfer fair at the beginning of it. So those teachers that wish to um, do the voluntary transfer will have the opportunity to meet with um, potential um, principals that will give them the opportunity for moves where those opportunities exist. And then after that, from six to eight, it's where we have our full career fair for those new people that are looking to come in and be part of the Paulding County family. So that's, in a nutshell, what we're um, rolling out right now with human resources. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it becomes an extremely busy time of, of the school year. Any questions from me? Thank you, Ms. White. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. <clears throat> All right. So um, thank you so much. Uh, at this time, we're going to go into board member comments and uh, you'll see in your uh, there's an attachment in here from a uh, town hall meeting that Mr. Dean and Mr. Anavatardi conducted. How long ago was that? September. In September. So what we'll do, I'll save them for the end and they promised it would only be five minutes. So let's do this. Let's start with Ms. Cobb. Let's skip you and we'll come and we'll skip Jason and we'll come back and let y'all do it together. Um, but we'll start with Ms. Cobb and just go down the line to Mr. Chester. Um, I just wanted to uh, to thank our staff again for the social emotional learning that that Dr. Otot mentioned at the family connection meeting. It's it's very good to let our partners know how we're doing as far as the emotional health of our children, so that they can help us. And then um, after the polar plunge on February eighth that morning, we do have the Education Foundation Casino Night, 
and that is at the senior center and there's still a few tickets available maybe for a few more days and then we'll have to cut off the ticket window because we we have so this is a great time for our staff um, a lot of them have memberships and do the give me five and this is something they get back for that as a ticket to that but as well as anyone else who wants to come and support our school district with the um, money for scholarships and grants it's a great opportunity and, it, and it's been uh, noted as the best night out in Paulding for the last few years so that's our seventh annual one um, and I just want to thank Mr. Dean and Mr. Anabatardi for the, uh, the special needs uh, town hall they had. It was very well received, and um, it's, it was amazing to see how quickly the, the ticket window for that um, closed up because you had so many people wanting to come. So I think, I think that's a great opportunity for people to give us feedback on some of the issues we may not hear about that need addressing. You good? I'm good as well. Ms. Lyons? <clears throat> Are you good? Um, I really don't have a whole lot. Um, one concern that I do have, though, is with the STEM program, is, is it really going to be able to prepare the students for the school? Oh, baby. Turn it off. Um, that uh, those students concerning technology, if they're prepared for the, um, the programs that are available at the College and Career Academy, because the technology programs are pretty advanced, especially when it comes to, you know, the, the coding and the, um, can you not hear me? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you know, the cyber, uh, is it cyber security? Um, I don't know that they have the foundation that they need for the cyber security. So if, if you have a, a something that's a, a, something coming up, you're smiling, so you you must yes. have yes. this solution yes. ready. So, but right now it's it's you know these students aren't ready. But right, yes, and that's why we kind of advanced, and, and we were fortunate enough to get the grant to be able to to make sure that we have those middle schools transitioning into computer science education, right. six through eight, mm -hmm. so that it will definitely build that. And then also, also that transitioning of some of that family consumer science piece into right. more STEM related right. um, things that are going to align to the pathways and um, at the high schools and the college and career academy. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is, you mentioned the one school that's kind of doing the research on the uh, the flooding and the the swamp that you have. Yes. Uh, are they utilizing the GPS? To, to see the topography of the the base of the they are they, they are. are they're working with so many different uh, play, I, I can't even tell you how many <laughs> i wish i had a list of them of all the places that they're working with through ksu through right. uh, different companies that are coming mm -hmm. in and helping them do that yes okay great yes great they are. Hey, hang on, we're we're getting out of order on this. So Sorry. This is but you're okay. We, I, I, I would stay here and listen to you all day. I love it. Um, this is board member comments. So let's let's not open this back up. We have, but no, you're. I just don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. But oh, if no, you're, I'm, not, I'm good. Okay. I can so talk about I, STEM I, all day. <clears throat> we're gonna stay. We're gonna stay on track. So Miss Lyons, when you finish up, we'll we'll bring you back for another meeting too okay. later. So we're good. <laughs> Are you done, Miss Lyons? With with? I think so. Okay. Have a great day. All right. All right, Mr. Chester, Mr. Dean, y'all ready for your presentation? No? Okay. I don't have a presentation. They're not a presentation. They're comments. They're, yeah. I don't have anything, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad Nick's doing it instead of me. <laughs> no, he's good. He's oh, ready. Okay. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we did a special needs um, a town hall meeting at Westridge Church. And I'm going to try to go over some of our desired outcomes and background and some of the data that we got out of the meeting and some recommendations that we derived from this meeting and, and hopefully a path forward. And then uh, what, we was, what we was trying to do was, was to listen to the families with special needs before we could come up with a, a better relationship between the families with special needs and the teachers and the school district. And this included students with learning disabilities and all. We're trying to look at a cultural shift of how we look at special needs. Uh, uh, my wife and I are actually going to West Ridge Church to the um, Tom Tebow, uh, we call it a prom night uh, for, for my wife and I, but to change the way we look at special needs and, and the way we approach it and, and develop more of a 
more advocacy. I know Dr. Otak has had meetings with West Ridge Church to see how we can partner together uh, and McKenna Farms and there's other great assets out here that we should be looking at and to try to provide the best facilities possible for our children uh, with special needs and learning disabilities. And so with that, just kind of to give you some background on where we were at, uh, what we did is September the 5th, um, we did a town hall meeting at West Ridge. We had, uh, uh, Ms. Cobb mentioned that we had a great turnout. We announced it, I think, on Tuesday, and we had almost 100 people sign up by Friday <coughs> with a 45% attendance. And we had actually had people walk in that didn't even sign up, so it was a great <coughs> The attitude in the meeting was very positive. It was not a the school board's not doing this, this district's not doing this. It was here's where here's what we're feeling and here's what we're so I took the comments. My wife took comments. Uh, Ms. Cobb took comments. Jason uh, and everybody had different notes that we took. So I compiled them and they actually fell into four different categories. It's sort of like uh, Steve's um, budget report. You, you can't really put them in bu buckets, but these are the best buckets I could come up with. They dealt with communications, facilities, funding, and curriculum. And out of the top three areas that were identified during this, IEPs, training, and facilities were the three top issues that were identified. There were several, several others. I had uh, five <coughs> or six pages of notes. <coughs> These were repetitive. Uh, I think uh, IEPs had like six different people had commented on IEPs and how they were conducted. Uh, and if, for example, facilities. So the number one comment was sensory rooms and was the what? travel to and from the different sensory areas. Rooms. So rooms. with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jason now and let him finish some of the conclusions and recommendations. And yeah, so I mean, I think we just, um, you know, we appreciate all the the parents and. Um, citizens who participated even those that did not attend that sent us pages and pages of comments um and i think we all looked at it as kind of an opportunity um you know in terms of you know i i keep going back to what mr albright keeps talking about in terms of the growth in the next two to five years and um you know i know the the financial strains that we're under and being cognizant of that but i think you know as mr barnett pointed out with seeing the ESEPT um enrollment you know constantly running above trend and i don't think that trend changing anytime soon um i think as we 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 see the special needs population in our county um growing i think we have to to be mindful and adapt to that and and those of us who who have grandchildren or children or or, or friends um, or family members who may have children with ieps um, um, or special needs um, children um, I think just being mindful of, um, you know, the environment that those families and the circumstances that they work through every day. So some of the recommendations we came up with, and, and again, this is not what I would consider a, you know, a silver bullet, bulletproof, uh, perfect list, but things I, I would ask, you know, I think Mr. Dean would ask um, the board and, and, and uh, school district to consider um, and working with our leaders and parents is just around um, developing a parent children's bill of rights with a clear understanding of what are their rights and access to resources and services. Um, this goes back to, um, I think, making it um, as clear as day as terms of kind of what are their rights. And I know a lot of parents are always asking and searching for that information. Um, and so I think that's one opportunity. I think the second opportunity is around defining and refining the differences between diagnosis and doctor recommendations. Um, supporting borderline students with limited assistance. Um, these are students that um, may, not, may not necessarily need an IEP, but um, maybe should, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say treated, but in the sense of, um, I think that engagement between the school district and the child, um, ensure the students getting the support as if the student did have an IEP or at that level of service, um, I think, uh, for those children. Um, IEP education and training, uh, workshops between teachers and parents, annual teacher training, paraprofessional training, uh, parent and, uh, uh, mediator training. Um, I think some, some additional district-wide autism awareness training just in the big picture um, 
for any employee who may engage with an uh, in ta- in, uh, autistic student. Um, and then I think it's just identifying plan implementation, any facility equipment needs. And, and, and lastly, I'll just add, I know all of this is mindful that, you know, um, you know there are budget constraints. I know there's um, pressures on the district um, from a variety of places. And I know we've talked about that with Dr. Otot and, and, and Barnett, uh, Mr. Barnett, just being mindful of, um, I think, just level setting expectations. But I think um, as we kind of look to move forward and support our special needs students and families um, across the county, that these are things that we would um, ask the board just to have additional conversation and, and um, consider as we uh, look towards building the budget. And um, it's really about, I think, um, creating a defined culture um, that um, everywhere we go in the county, we have ambassadors that um, you know are, are, are fighting for these types of things and um, and working with them um, in terms of you know continuing to make sure this county is a is a special place to live, work, and play. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I conclude. Well, thank you, <clears throat> thank you too very much for taking your time and, and hosting that meeting and. Um, I would encourage uh, I would encourage maybe do that same meeting again at some point because um, it's such a, an important uh, part of what we do. Um, Mr. Chairman, we can also come back in a very session. Okay. Find you guys a presentation where we are. Gotcha. Ms. Cobb. I would like to mention one thing I may have mentioned a little bit. One thing that came up a few times was transportation, which we know we have we we have such a large county geographically. It is hard to get children to certain programs, and that's something that. I know they have a hard time dealing with, as well as something as that may be as simple when we're looking at these additions to schools. Um, I think unless you have special needs students or work with them, you don't realize how desperate some of those needs are as far as bathroom facilities, changing facilities, and laundry facilities. And that's something that when our schools were normally built, they're not thought of. But as we modify them, I would I know that our staff is it takes special people to work with those kids. And it would be a big help to have areas that, you know, they can take care of a child as well as do any cleaning that needs to be done um, in a local area. So if we can just try to keep that in mind as we're making additions as well. All right. Well, at this time, we're going to go ahead and uh, take a motion to adjourn into executive session. No votes will be taken other than the minutes from January 14th. We'll discuss uh, student discipline, personnel, and legal. Do I hear a motion? So moved by Mr. Dean, second by Ms. Cobb. Any discussion? All in favor of adjourning to executive session, please show by raising your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we're going to go ahead and reconvene. No votes were taken in executive session. At this time, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to uh, uh, Dr. Otot for uh, personnel, uh, the action items and the personnel recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Request approval of personnel items 165. Here, here in the so moved by Ms. Lyons. Second. Second by Mr. Chester. Any discussion? All in favor, please show by raising your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Um, next, I approve request approval of the November, December 2019 tribunal reports. Here. Motion by Mr. Anvitardi. Second by Mr. Dean. Any discussion? All in favor, please show by raising your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Um, <clears throat> Hearing a recommendation on the field trip report, do we hear a motion? So moved by Mr. Dean, second by Mr. Albright. Any discussion? All in favor, please show by raising your hand. Motion passes unanimously. And with nothing else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion by Mr. Chester. I'll second it. I'd like to say one thing. Tomorrow, uh, there is a legislative luncheon at the Capitol that is, um, it's being sponsored by another group, but we will have our, what? We will have our uh, legislators available to hand these out to you. And to be Where's that at again? Uh, it's going to be at the railroad, which is the, the oh. right across the street from yeah. the Capitol. Gotcha. So we'll hand these out and. Apology. All right. All in favor of adjourning, please show up by raising your hand. Okay. You have one too? Uh, we no. Each of our board members a copy of confidential material. It, it potentially has confidential material in it. Nobody's reviewed it. It's those requests for the, R, the responses to the RFPs that Mr. Dean, I think, asked for. So it has not been reviewed. So just be careful. They, most most responses to RFPs are not confidential, but they could contain within the response some confidential information. So just don't disseminate those to anyone. I return mine back to Mr. Clark.
That's all. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm sorry. All right. All in favor of adjourning, show by raising your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Meeting adjourned.